Good morning, everyone. If I could just go through the housekeeping announcements with you for today. There's no planned fire alarm test today. The fire alarm test is usually on a Wednesday at 4.45. If the alarm sounds, trained fire wardens on the second floor will direct you to evacuate. There are two fire exits within the room on the right-hand side facing the chair. That's on that side of the room. Holborn Bar staff and the inquiry team will ensure you are evacuated first before they evacuate the building. Please do not leave personal possessions in the hearing room overnight. Any items found will be removed by security. At the end of the session, please remain seated until the chairman and the witness have left the room. Also, please remember to switch your phones to silent in the hearing room. I've also been asked to advise you that we do have support workers both in this room and on the second floor. They are available um, for anyone that might wish to speak to them. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. <coughs> Welcome to today's hearing. Today we're going to start hearing from expert witnesses instructed by the inquiry to advise us in relation to various aspects of the fire. Uh, yes, good yes, morning. Ms. Grange. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Yes, we will be hearing today from Professor Jose Torero, who is one of three experts who will be giving evidence this week. Professor Bisbee and Dr. Lane will follow tomorrow and Thursday. Yeah. So if I can now call Professor Torero. Thank you, yes. Solemnly, sincerely and truly. I declare and affirm 
declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give, that the evidence I shall give shall, be the truth, shall be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth and, nothing but the truth. and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Professor. Sit, sit down and make yourself comfortable. Um, Ms. Grange, before you start, I think um, I'm sure the Professor is well used to delivering lectures and other material for quite extended periods, but I think we should have a break oh, during absolutely. the middle of the morning. Yes. I think possibly one break will be sufficient, unless you, Professor, indicate that you'd like one at any other stage. If you do, of course, let me know. Okay, thank yeah, you. That's helpful. That right? Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Right. Yes, yes, thank you. So please, would you give the inquiry your name? Uh, Jose Luis Torero Cullen. And you have provided to the inquiry a preliminary phase one report, which was dated the 23rd of May. And you have updated that report in a revised version dated the 21st of October 2018 and also with an accompanying two-page addendum document dated the 20th of October, is that right? Yes. And that report addresses your preliminary conclusions on the ignition of the Grenfell Tower facade materials, fire spread to and on the exterior of Grenfell Tower, and fire and smoke spread within Grenfell Tower, that's right, yes? Yes, that's correct. And it's important to note that you have also been instructed to provide a further report at phase two, which will address forensic fire and smoke spread throughout Grenfell Tower, the correlation between the fire safety provisions and the fire safety strategy for Grenfell Tower, and various aspects of the adequacy of the London Fire Brigade's procedures and training, an overview of conclusions to be drawn about the Grenfell Tower fire, an overview of lessons to be learned when comparing the Grenfell Tower fire with other fires, both international and domestic, and any recommendations arising from the same. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Now, as you indicate in the declaration in section 1.5 of your report, you have provided it in the same way as you would have provided a report to a court. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And in section 1.4 of your report, you have outlined your background and experience relevant to the matters in this inquiry. We don't need to rehearse all of that today, but I just want to pick out some key points. Now, you specialise in fire safety, having originally trained as a mechanical engineer and then gone on to specialise in fire safety. Is that yes. correct? You are currently the John L. Bryan Chair at the Department of Fire Protection Engineering and the Director of the Centre for Disaster Resilience at the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Maryland in the USA, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And previously, you were the Professor of Civil Engineering and Head of the School of Civil Engineering at the University of Queensland in Australia between 2012 and 2017, is that yes, correct? Yes, that's correct. And before moving to Australia, you held the Land Alton Company Chair for Innovation for a Sustainable Future at the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne in Switzerland in 2012. Yes. And you also held the BRE Trust Royal Academy of Engineering Chair in Fire Safety Engineering at the University of Edinburgh between 2004 and 2011. Yes. In 2008, you were awarded the Arthur B. Guise Medal by the Society of Fire Protection Engineers in the USA, and in 2011, the David Rabash Medal by the Institution of Fire Engineers in recognition for eminent achievement in the education, engineering, and science of fire safety. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. You were the editor-in-chief of the Fire Safety Journal between 2010 and 2016. Yes. And you have been involved in numerous fire in investigations, many of which have been landmark studies. Uh, between 20, 2001 and 2010, you were involved in an independent investigation of the World Trade Center buildings, one and two collapses. Yes. You have conducted a cause and origin investigation into the Texas City explosion at subsequent fires, as well as a damage correlation exercise. Yes. You conducted dispersion fire modelling, supporting the litigation relevant to the Buntsfield explosion and the Sergo mine explosion in the USA. Yes, that's correct. And you conducted a post-fire structural assessment of the Abu Dhabi Plaza fire in Kazakhstan, probably the biggest ever fire of a building un under construction. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Now, you've been awarded a number of prizes uh, in this field for your writing 
Um, I just want to pick out one. For you have, together with your co-authors, been awarded the FM Global Best Paper Award for a paper on the precision of fire models and the required skills for fire modelling. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, correct. Thank you. Are the factual matters set out in your report true to the best of your knowledge and belief? I believe so. Does your report accurately set out your opinions on matters relevant to this inquiry? Yes, it does. Thank you. So I want to start by just asking you a few general questions about fire safety strategies in high-rise buildings. In section two of your report, you have explained the concept of a fire safety strategy for high-rise buildings. But you've explained, that this, and you've explained that this is a concept by which measures are taken to ensure societally acceptable levels of fire safety. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. But you have not defined that at this stage by reference to any specific document which may have been produced in the context of Grenfell Tower. You are talking about fire safety strategies generally for high-rise buildings. Is that that's, correct? Yes, that's correct. Page 17 of your report, you've explained that the main characteristic that defines a high-rise building is what you call a convergence of timescales. Yes. Can you just explain for us what you mean by that? Yes. Uh, there's several factors that uh, happen when you have a fire. Fire is, uh, is unusual in the sense that it's one of the few hazards that actually evolves in space and time. So it is going to grow as a function of time, and it can grow slower or faster. Normally, for example, if you were to have a low-rise building, uh, egress time, so the time that it takes for people to get out, is extremely fast. So effectively, that is an independent time scale. In a few minutes, you will get everybody out, while the fire can take half an hour or an hour to grow. Uh, in a similar manner, the structure is going to take a significant time to heat up. So you can separate the time scales and basically get the life safety aspects of the building taken care of in a few minutes, while everything else has a different time scale. Now, in the case of a tall building, that is not possible because you have multiple levels. So it will normally take a very significant period of time for people to be able to descend through those levels. And therefore, uh, the number of minutes that it will take to address the life safety issues of people can be well within an hour. And therefore, it will converge with the time that it takes for the fire to take uh, its full extent. And it will also converge with the time that it will take for the structure to start heating up and start being deteriorated by the fire. So what you get in the case of a high rise is a very unique scenario that because the egress time scales are very, very long, then what you have is a situation with, where all the time scales converge. So you have to address structural behavior, fire growth, and egress in a simultaneous manner when you address the problem of fire safety. And you've said in your report that um, the time for occupants, occupants to evacuate is of, often of the same order of magnitude as the time for failure or the time required for fire and rescue service intervention. Can you just be clear what you mean by failure in that context? Yes, so uh, in, in a very short period of time, um, you will probably have a situation by which the fire has not yet grown to a point that is affecting any component of the building. So you would not expect, for example, a structure to fail, a door to fail, a window to crack. You would expect people to be out of those spaces before that. In a similar manner, uh, we have uh, pre-specified required times for the fire service to arrive on site. And depending on which country, which jurisdiction you have, there will be you know, a few minutes, five minutes, six minutes. And, uh, and, and therefore, uh, you, all life safety aspects of the building in principle would have been taken care of before the firefighters arrive or before anything has failed. So people will be out of the building and they will be safe before any of these things happen. In a tall building, because it takes much longer for people to arrive, you would expect that the firefighters would have arrived on scene before everybody is out of the building, and you would have expected that before everybody is out of the building, some components of the building will already be experiencing some element of distress or failure. I see. Yeah. And can you explain the significance of that convergence of timescales for a high-rise strategy? Um, does it mean, for example, that you need safe areas to, to exist in the building? Yes, the, because you cannot take everybody out in such a short period of time that they are not being affected by the fire itself. 
uh, people are going to be in the building while certain areas of the building are already going to be fully compromised. So you can have a fire that starts, like in the case of Grenfell, in the kitchen, and, uh, and that fire has already fully compromised the kitchen before people have had enough time to be able to get out of the building. So a way in which we address the problem is we sectorize the building and we create safe areas. So what we are considering as our time to egress is the time that it takes not to get out of the building, but the time that it takes to enter a place that is considered to be a safe place. So by creating the sectors and separating the building in different components, we are allowing certain parts of the building to be fully compromised while other parts of the building remain perfectly safe. So people can actually be in those parts uh, while the building is being affected by the fire. And you say in your report that the most common safe areas are the stairwells. And you also say that there's no limit to the time that stairwells need to remain safe. Can you just expand on that? Yes, uh, because in a high rise, you're going to have a situation in which people are going to be evacuating for a very long period of time. There's very significant uncertainty on human behavior. So the time scales are very difficult to predict. So it's very difficult to calculate how long would a person be within a building. Uh, there's been cases, for example, like the first bombing of the World Trade Center, uh, where effectively people were inside the stairs for many hours. Hours. And, uh, and so we have to make provisions to protect those areas in such a way that they remain viable for as long as it is necessary. And because as long as it's necessary, it's not very well defined, you know, we have to make that almost a permanent feature of the building. So you talk about redundancies being necessary for all safety systems. And you explain also that lobbies are typical of redundancies built into a fire safety strategy. Can you explain why those redundancies are so important? I think you'd probably just explain that, but yeah. with reference to lobbies as well as stairs. Yeah, every, every time you design a safety system, uh, safety systems are not perfect, and, uh, and there will always be a probability of failure. So uh, you cannot rely on a single safety system to protect the lives of people. So what you do is you always introduce multiple levels of redundancy until you're satisfied that the, pro the overall probability of the entire chain is so low that you can almost guarantee you know, the safety of, uh, of, of people. So depending on, on the complexity of the system, you will introduce more levels of redundancy. And, um, and if a system is very simple, you might need just maybe two levels of redundancy. You know, but if a system is very complex, for example, if you're dealing with a nuclear power plant, you will have multiple levels of redundancy to make sure that the system doesn't fail. So we, we as, a, as a common practice in any matter of safety, we will always introduce to all safety systems levels of redundancy to make sure that in case something doesn't work, there is something else to cover you know, for us. Now, in your report, in general, what you've done is you've broken down the substance of that report into four seminal stages in the progress of the fire at Grenfell Tower. And you say that these four stages are where distinctive interactions between the fire, the building, its occupants, and the fire brigade were observed. I'm just going to establish what these four stages are at this stage. So stage one is initiation of the fire event through to breach of the compartment of origin, which is approximately um, 0054 a.m. to, to 105 a.m., Stage two is from the breaching of that compartment of origin to the point when the fire reaches the top of the building on the east face, approximately 1.05 a.m. to 1.30 a.m. Stage three you characterize as lateral fire spread and internal migration of the fire and smoke until the full compromise of the interior of the building, including the stairs. And again, that's approximately 1.30 a.m. to 2.30 a.m. And stage four is what you describe as the untenable stage, where significant parts of the building are untenable. We'll come back to this. Uh, approximately 2.30 a.m. until extinction is the untenable stage. Now, as I say, we're going to come back to each of those stages in detail during your evidence. But at this stage, can you just explain why you have chosen to divide the fire into those four stages in your report? Yes. Um the, 
I mean, beyond just trying to keep a little bit of order to all this information, I think the, the different uh, stages have uh, very distinct uh, characteristics that are uh, quite fundamental to the behavior of the building, and therefore I believed it was very important to separate those. Uh, the, the first stage is, uh, to me, fundamental because, um, as I explained in my report, at the backbone of the fire safety strategy is the concept of no spread, external spread of the fire. So we make this assumption that the fire will be boxed in within one floor. And on the basis of boxing in the fire within one floor, even beyond that, within one unit, you know, we make this assumption that the fire is boxed in. And on the basis of that, we construct the whole fire safety strategy. So the primary assumption behind every component of the fire safety strategy remains this concept of having the fire boxed in within one unit. So uh, that initial stage represents the period where the building is actually behaving as designed where effectively the fire is boxed in within the unit and it has not managed to come out and penetrate other uh, units within, within the building. So, so that particular stage effectively represents the building operating as designed. Now the second stage, again, it, it, is, it is fundamental in the sense that the building is now not operating as designed. Nevertheless, within that process of vertical flame spread, which is quite rapid, uh, there is no significant evidence that the means of egress in the building have been severely compromised. So effectively, uh, there is still the ability that the redundancies that we have in the building have provided of enabling people to actually migrate uh, out, out of the building. Now, by the time you get to the third stage uh, of the building, the process becomes a very dynamic process in which effectively we have sufficient evidence that the means of egress have been compromised. Now, the, the fact that they are compromised doesn't necessarily mean that uh, people cannot get in you know, into those means of egress and successfully get out. All that it means is that there is significant evidence that there is a deterrent for people to do so, uh, in the sense that there will be smoke in many ways, people will be identifying smoke. So effectively, the means of egress are not acting the way they should be acting. So we have fundamentally breached all levels of redundancy, and we have reached to the core of the safe area you know, of the building. Now, the final stage of the fire is when there is a generalized perception that that uh, core uh, safety area of the building has been lost. And therefore, there is very little evidence that people can actually use the means of egress to exit the building. So let's start then and look in detail at stage one, which yes. is the breach of the compartment, that first compartment. And we've got this time frame at 0054 through to roughly 1.05 a.m. Um, at section 3.1 of your report, you've explained that you have conducted a simple modeling analysis, what you describe as a simple first principles elimination analysis of the fire scenario in the compartment of origin. Is that correct? Yes. And you say that you've done this to bound the actual fire scenario within the kitchen more precisely. Can you explain what you mean by bound the actual fire scenario? Yes. I think one of the things that is, is always very important to try to establish is that is if this event was outside the expected uh, conditions that the building was designed for. So if you are in, in, in a housing uh, complex, there are certain fire events that we accept as being events that are a regular occurrence. Uh, what I call in my report an event of probability of one. Uh, now, people sometimes believe that fire is a rare event, and, and actually fires are not rare events. Fires occur very regularly. Uh, what happens is that generally we have put so many provisions to try to protect us from fire that what becomes a rare event is an event of a magnitude <coughs> that is sufficient to actually affect people or affect the building in a significant way. So we have all these provisions, and we designed these provisions to be able to cope with certain scenarios. And those scenarios are considered to be the, the common scenarios. So the first thing that I was trying to establish 
is given the evidence that we have and the actual nature of the evidence that we have that is quite coarse, and this is quite common you know, to a reconstruction of a fire, that you are working from debris, so it's very difficult to get very detailed information uh, of everything that was happening in, in, in the space. So what we're aiming at is to try to look and see if the fires that created the situation uh, were of a nature that was extraordinary. Now, by doing this very small bounding analysis, which is we took the worst possible fire growth, the slowest possible fire growth, and we applied it into the kitchen. Now, the kitchen has a very small floor plan, so effectively is very rapidly filled up with smoke. Now, for a fire to burn, you need fuel and you need oxygen. So either lack of either of the two of them will actually stop the fire. Now, if the fire gets strong enough, then what happens is that the temperature of the smoke gets so hot that the fire follows this process that is called flashover. So effectively, everything within the compartment ignites, and, um, and effectively, the fire flashes over. So what we had observed uh, was that in the particular kitchen of, of Grenfell Tower, uh, the fire had never reached flashover. So effectively, what happened was that at some point during the growth of the fire, the fire either was lacking fuel or it was lacking oxygen in such a way that it could not get to temperatures that were high enough to bring the room to flash over. Just so, pausing there, what would you have expected to see uh, in a flashover event that we didn't see in the kitchen of Flat 16? So if in, in a flashover event, every combustible material would have ignited because there is enough heat coming from the smoke to bring them to ignition. So what you will get is effectively the full uh, destruction uh, of all the, the components. Now, you, you can see, for example, in, in, in Grenfell, uh, there's appliances, for example, which the paint remains undamaged. So the fact that the paint remains undamaged, that means that the fire did not reach flush over because the paint would have blistered and ignited. So, so effectively, there's sufficient evidence uh, within the space of elements that were in, pro in sufficient proximity that actually were not ignited by the fire, which basically meant that there was no attainment you know, of flush over. So given that we, we, we have that evidence, that is our key piece of evidence, and we can go back and try to then uh, put as much fuel as we can and as small as fuel as we can, uh, given the, the, the typical fuels that you have in, in there, and see when it stops having enough oxygen. Effectively, the smoke has descended to the floor, and the oxygen is prevented from reaching the fire, and therefore the fire cannot continue to increase. Not because the fuel is not there, but because the oxygen is not getting there. And, uh, and by doing that, we can ascertain that the fire that actually was occurring in that space you know, was somewhere between 60 and 300 kilowatts. So I'm going to come to that. Um, so in your simple modeling that you've done in the yeah. main body of your report, just, just to be clear what the parameters are for that simple model, you've assumed that all windows and doors to the kitchen were closed. And you've plotted different fire scenarios, the, the size of the fire and its heat release rate. We see that reference, HRR, heat release rate. Can you just explain what a heat release rate is? Yes. So the heat release rate is the actual energy that is being released by the fire. And as you said, you've looked at fire growth and you've classified the fire as either slow, medium, fast or ultra fast. Are those general classifications that are routinely used in fire modeling? Yes, those are classifications that are used mostly for fire for design, yep. and therefore they are the classic uh, classifications that we will use to test our design. So is what we normally will use as a reference to try to bound the fire. So a slow fire will be as, as low as possible and an ultra fast as fast as possible. They're your two extremes. Extremes. And is it right that your simple model also assumes that the fire is in the middle of the room? Well, um, the, the kind of model that we're doing, uh, it doesn't make any difference uh, where the fire is. Uh, it basically uh, treats the problem in a way such that it doesn't really matter you know, where, where you put the fire. And the reason for that is that in a small compartment of that nature, the impact of the fire uh, will effectively affect the entire compartment almost simultaneously, so it really doesn't matter where you put the fire.
Yeah. Let's just go to one of your figures which help illustrate this. Can we go to your figure six? Now we've got um, a new reference for this document because it didn't appear very, as clearly as we'd like in your, in your report. Can we go to JTOS603, please, on the screen? And can we zoom in on the top diagram, please? So just to be clear, unfortunately, in the, the, the PDF of your report that we released, the smoke layer, the grey smoke layer, wasn't very clear. Um, so can you just explain what this basic model is showing? Yes, so basically that, that, that shows a little bit of a schematic of, uh, of the model that, that we presented. And basically what it shows is an upper smoke layer in grey, which will be basically an homogeneous layer that represents the smoke. And then in the bottom, you have the air. So the fire acts as a pump. So it basically takes fresh air and then sends smoke you know, to the top. And uh, that is called a two-zone model, and it's, a very, it's the most simple representation uh, that we have as a tool, as a regularly used tool uh, of a fire. And if we now go to figure seven, which if we can pull up JTOS 601, <laughs> at page 39. <coughs> and if we can zoom in on the graph at the top, please. Figure seven. Now, this explains the, the results of your simple modeling yes. in basic terms, is that correct? Can you yes. just talk us through what we see here? Yes, so basically what you get is the temperature of the smoke on the vertical axis, and you get the time on the horizontal axis. Uh, the red curve shows the evolution of the temperature of the smoke as a function of time. So as you see, because that is the ultra-fast fire, the temperature will grow faster. Now, by the time it reaches, in this particular example, uh, I need to clarify that we run this model num multiple times and under different conditions. And uh, so in this particular example, the, uh, the fire will, the smoke will reach the floor and the fire will stop growing at a temperature of about 230 degrees. And uh, in the other extreme, uh, you know, will be the, the case of the, of the slow growth fire. And what you can see is the temperatures are growing much, much slower. And, uh, and the smoke layer will touch the floor, and the fire will stop growing at that point when the temperatures reach slightly above 100 degrees. Yeah. So in this very simple model, um, we've got a peak heat release rate before smoke filled the kitchen during the ultra-fast fire of approximately 300 kilowatts which corresponds to a hot layer of approximately 220 degrees, is that right? Yes. Yeah. And in contrast, with the slow fire growth, that results in a peak heat release rate of approximately 60 kilowatts and a hot layer temperature of approximately 110 degrees centigrade, is that yes. right? And so you've put your fire in the size range 60 to 300 kilowatts in terms of heat release rate on your simple modeling? Yes. Is that a small or a large fire? So a 60 kilowatt fire will be no bigger than a waste paper basket. Uh, a 300 kilowatt fire will be about half a chair. Uh, so in both cases, uh, those will be fires that we will expect to be below our typical design values. So these are the kinds of fires that you would expect we will regularly have in a housing building, and therefore we, the building has to respond appropriately to these fires. Now you say on page 39 of your report that you've used a computation zone modeling tool, which enables you to look at different fire scenarios in your analysis, is that right? Yes. And that's a computer modeling tool developed in the USA, is that correct? Yes, it's a computer model developed by the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, and it's called CFAST. CFAST, yeah. yeah. And you say that this enabled you, for example, to model the fire, including with an open kitchen door. Yes. Um, and you say that the results of that show that if the door was open, then the smoke layer will exit the kitchen, allowing the fire to grow because of the oxygen resulting in higher temperatures and a flashover, is that correct? Yes. 
And is it right that the heat release rate necessary to deliver that flashover was around 1,000 kilowatts? Yes, it will be approximately 1,000 kilowatts. And what you said about that very basic modelling is it confirms that the kitchen door was probably closed during the early stages of the fire, is that yes. correct? Yes. Yeah. Now, just turning then to Appendix B of your revised report, can you confirm that in that appendix you've now provided some more detail of the additional modelling work that you have done? Yes. And is it right that you've expanded Appendix B in your most recent report, served in October, compared with what we saw in May? Yes. And in general, can you just explain, in very general terms, what you've sought to do in Appendix B? Yes. I think one, one of the very important aspects of, uh, of, of an analysis of this nature is to be able to use the tool that is appropriate for the precision of the input elements that we have. So we have some information from the scene, we have some information from videos, and, uh, and on the basis of that we have to use a model that has a consistent level of precision. If we use a model that is more precise, effectively what we're doing is giving a false sense of precision. So we have to stick to a model that is uh, of adequate uh, or comparable level of precision to the information that we have. So the simple model is that. Now, what I do is to gain confidence on my simple model, then what I do is I use more sophisticated tools to inform me and run a whole bunch of other different scenarios, all different characteristics, try to play with different variables that are enabled by a more sophisticated model, just to make sure that the answers that I provided with my simple model are correct. So effectively, this whole exercise of Appendix B is a mechanism to gain confidence on the validity of the simple model. And you've explained that you've done two different forms of modelling. You've done the computation zone modelling, the CFAS modelling you just talked yes. about. And you've also done something called computational fluid dynamics, or CFD modelling using a simulator. Can you just explain the difference between the two and what that is? Yes. Uh, so the simple model that I use effectively uses two layers. So it has a hot layer and a cold layer, and it has no openings. So effectively, you're just filling a box. Uh, the CFAST uses the same two layers, but it allows to open and, door, uh, open and close doors and windows so that you can allow flows through the doors and the windows. So it is the same model conceptually, but it allows you to have that possibility of taking smoke out and getting more fresh air in. Now, while the computational fluid dynamics model, we, it was developed by the same organization, the uh, National Institutes of Standards and Technology, and it's called the Fire Dynamics Simulator. And effectively, that what it does, it breaks the room into slightly little cubes so instead of having two big layers, what you have is thousands of little cubes, and you're basically modeling every little cube. So you can resolve in every position of the room what the temperature is going to be and, uh, and, and basically the heat release rate and the flows and all the details. So it's just simply a higher spatial resolution so you can see what is happening in every point. Is what we see in Appendix B the same as a sensitivity analysis? Uh, it's beyond a sensitivity analysis because a sensitivity analysis, normally what it is, is you take the input parameters that you put in and you vary them through a certain percentage just to make sure that your inputs are correct. Here, we're trying to test also the physics. By using a much more sophisticated physics with the same inputs, we're trying to make sure that actually the simple model is delivering the right answers to the questions that we want to answer. <coughs> So let's just start with the computation zone modelling that you've carried out. Uh, you've explained in Appendix B that two zone model variations have been used for this more specific analysis. First, trying to model the assumed ventilation conditions based on the avail available evidence. For example, kitchen door closed, main window partially open. And then secondly, exploring other scenarios, for example, kitchen door open or closed or other windows open. Now, before we discuss the results of those models, I just want to remind ourselves what the kitchen window looked like in flat 16, because I think that's helpful to, to remind ourselves of that. Can we go to one of the figures in Dr. Lane's report? That's BLAS 608 at page 23. Thank you. So I think this is the kitchen window. I believe I think it's in flat 13 on the opposite side. But this is... 
Can you confirm this is effectively the same window that we had in flat 16? Yes. And we see on the top right an ex a kitchen extractor fan mm -hmm. with a surrounding unit, a surrounding panel. Yes. And then a, a large window on the left. Can you just confirm how that window could open? So that window could open tilted inwards or open uh, completely. So in swinging in or yeah. tilting in. Yeah. yeah. And how about the little window underneath the kitchen extractor fan? Uh, I believe it could only swing open. So when yeah. you talk about looking at different modeling, different scenarios of different windows open, we're talking about these windows here. Exactly. Thank you. Now, in terms of your modeling, for scenario one, which is the assumed ventilation conditions based on the existing evidence, which is kitchen door closed, large window partially open, what you've said is that your, your more sophisticated modeling shows that the heat re release rate is in the range 110 to 360 kilowatts. Is that right? Yes. And you say that compares well with your simple model of, of 60 to 300 kilowatts. Yes. And in scenario two, you say that the extra ventilation from the open door means a flashover scenario with a peak heat, re heat release rate of 1.5 megawatts. Is that correct? Yes. Now, turning then to the computational fluid dynamics, you just talked about these tiny little pieces of the jigsaw in the box. Yep. You've explained the results uh, in, in Appendix B. Is it right that you've modelled the whole flat, say for, I think, the second bedroom and the living room, where it was assumed that these doors were closed? Uh, yes, the figure 82 of my report will show the, the, the model that we conducted. We can go, we can go to that. Yeah, so if we go to JT, no, I don't think it's 140. Figure 82, yes. Yep. JTOS 601. So you will see we At modeled... page 141. Yeah, if we... you just wait for it to come up on the screen. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, and if we can zoom in on figure 82. Thank you. Yep. So we can see on the right-hand side that we are modeling the kitchen and all the rooms adjacent to the kitchen under the assumption that the partition uh, is closed and uh, basically the smoke can leave the corridor. And, uh, and enter uh, only the, the bedroom in, in the back. And you've looked at the fire being located both on the floor and behind the fridge, is that yes. right? Yes, yes. Can you just explain why you've done that? Um, the, the, the dynamics of the fire are, are very different if you have a fire that is on the floor than if you have one that is progressing behind an obstacle. Uh, when you have a fire that is progressing behind an obstacle, you will restrain the amount of air that can get into the fire, so the flames will be longer because the fuel requires to get air from higher points to be able to be fully consumed. While if you put it in the middle, the flames will be shorter because you have air coming from all directions. So you have to model both extremes. And um, in, in the simple model, we only model <coughs> the one in the middle because we were looking for the smaller possible fire because we were bounding you know, the, 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 the conditions. So, but in here, we tried both just to make sure that we covered both potential scenarios. Yeah. And you say that you've modeled several ventilation conditions in terms of the windows being open or shut. Um, in terms of the fire size for the fridge, is it right that you've used results from some of the standalone tests that were carried out by the BRE for the Metropolitan Police? to estimate the potential heat release rate for the fridge? Yes. So what happened, as I understand it, is that the Metropolitan Police did some testing, setting fridges on fire, similar to those in Flat 16, to see what heat release rate that they got. Is that correct? Yes. Can we just look at the results um, in graph form from that? If we go to figure 57, which is on page 144 of your report, that's JTOS. 601, page 144. And if we can zoom in, there we go. Yeah. 
Now, what you said in your report is that the tests that, that were carried out, which are represented here, showed an initial peak heat release rate of 400 kilowatts after seven minutes from the start of the standalone fridge test. It then reduces to between 75 and 100 kilowatts before much later, after about 32 minutes, it peaks in the range of, of, of a megawatt to 1.6 megawatts. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And that's effectively what we see depicted in that, this graph here. Is that right? So we yes. can see that initial peak of 400 after, after seven minutes, but then a diminishing profile. Yes. You say in your report that these results are relatively consistent with the 60 to 300 kilowatt heat release rate range <coughs> that you've used for your simple model. Can you just explain that? Yes. So the, the tests that were conducted by BRE were conducted under a hood. So you're basically allowing for all the oxygen that is necessary to reach the fire. So this will be the maximum burning capacity of, of the refrigerator without considering the fact that oxygen might not get there, uh, like will happen in, in a compartment. So uh, if, if you look at the timeline uh, of um, about seven minutes until reaching 400, uh, that is fairly consistent with uh, somewhere in between a slow and an ultra fast. So it falls more or less in between uh, the, the range of values that we, um, uh, we worked with. Now, we observed also that the smoke layer descended in less than five minutes. So effectively, you will not reach to 400 uh, kilowatts. You will probably stop a little bit earlier because the smoke would have gone down. And, uh, and that's more or less what the results show, that effectively the fire stops growing because there's not enough air being able to feed you know, the, the, the fire. So uh, in many ways, using this as an input uh, is quite effective uh, in trying to compare it with the simple model to show that effectively all the numbers are within the same yeah. ranges that we were operating. So that explains why you haven't gone back in your main report and adjusted your range of 60 to 300 to make it 60 to 400. Uh, absolutely. I think, uh, again, I go back you know, to the fact that you know, we need to use the, the right tool for the right problem. So I do not want to, um, with my report, uh, make anybody think that we have more precision than the precision that the simple model has. So turning then to the results of your CFD model, you say that the results from that model for a fire located in the back of the fridge and with the large window tilted open, the small <coughs> window open, but the door closed, show that temperature magnitudes, both by the window and by the door, are within the, are within the bounds of the predictions in the simple model. Is that correct? That's correct. And you've also run the same analysis, but with a higher heat release rate, just to check the figures. Yes. At 400 to 500 kilowatts. Is that right? Yes. And you say again that for a fire located in the back of the fridge and with the large window open, small window open, but the door closed, the model managed to maintain the 400 kilowatt level, but it didn't maintain the 500 kilowatt level. Can you just explain that? Yes. So this type of model, because it's modeling things in a lot more detail, it allows you to see really how much energy is being released. And uh, so it's taking into account how much air is meeting with the fuel and how much energy really is releasing. So I can input energy, and, but I can measure also the output. So effectively, what this model does is whatever cannot burn, then it's left as unburned smoke that just goes away. And I can actually account for that. So effectively, with the model, I can tell that no matter how much energy I put in, only 400 burns. And uh, I can put 1,000, I can put 500, and it will immediately go back down and only 400 will burn. So effectively, it verifies that you are oxygen starved, so you cannot burn more because you don't have enough air getting into, mm. the, in, into the fire. Yeah. Now, you've also said in your Appendix B that your 60 to 300 kilowatt simple model gave a good estimate of average compartment temperatures, but that only the CFD model can establish something called the spatial distribution. Yes. Can you just explain to us what spatial distribution is? Yeah, because in the CFD, uh, we are modeling the small little cubes that fill up the entire compartment. Each cube will have a temperature. So I can know exactly what the temperature is in that point. 
So spatially, in all the directions, I can know exactly what the temperature is. In the other models, I'm assuming that the hot layer, the smoke, is only one temperature, and the cold layer is only one temperature. So I only have two numbers, and I don't have the spatial distribution mm. in the compartment. Makes sense. And you've also said that your CFD model delivers more accentuated temperatures, accentuated temperatures. Can you just explain what you mean by accentuated temperatures? Yes, so I think the easiest way to describe it is to look at... Um, figure 91, I think. Uh, figure 91, yes. Yes, so if we go JTOS601 at page 149. <coughs> yes, can you just explain... It by reference to, to this figure? Yes, so as you can see, in, in the dotted line represents a simple <laughs> model and, uh, and effectively it gives you the same temperature all along the height because the whole smoke layer has the same temperature. Mm -hmm. Now the, the CFD will show that the temperatures are slightly lower at the bottom and slightly hotter at the top and, and therefore gives you the distribution with height of the temperature. Now, one of the things that I need to clarify in there is that while it shows this accentuated temperatures and it shows that it's obviously going to be hotter at the top and colder at the bottom, uh, we cannot rely on those numbers. So those numbers are beyond the precision of the information that we have. So effectively, the fact that the red curve shows that you are at 300 degrees might not necessarily be correct. At the top, you probably don't have 300 degrees. You might have a little bit lower. And, uh, and those things we will never be able to ascertain because the precision of the information that we're inputting into the model is not good enough. So being able to say that is 260, 250 is about as precise as we can be. And yes, we can say it's plus minus 50 degrees, and that will be perfectly fine. But we cannot claim that the precision of the field curve is actually correct. Now, within the CFD modeling that you've carried out, you've also looked at variability by fire location, as we discussed before, both at floor level and at the back of the fridge freezer. Is that correct? Yes. And you've said that, I think you've mentioned this before, that a floor fire produces what you call more scatter of the data. Again, can you just explain what that means? Yes. What, what happens when you put a fire in, 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 in the floor is that the way in which the hot gases go up and they bring the cold gases in, creates a situation by which the flames fluctuate. You're going to have the hot gases going up, then they bring cold air, and then the flame shrinks because everything burns, and then the hot gases go up again. So you have flames that go like this, pulsating. That creates data points that are going to change. When the flames are up, then the temperature goes up. When the flames are down, the temperature goes down. Well, when you have a vertical fire and it's burning as a wall, everything is pushing up. So effectively, it's much more stable. And then what you get is fairly consistent temperatures at all the different, the different heights. Yeah. So does it follow from, from that that you accept that a fire located in a corner or against a wall will behave differently from a fire in the middle of the room? Oh, yes, they will behave differently. Nevertheless, uh, the, the more you confine the fire, so if you're behind something or you're in a corner, uh, effectively what you get is a taller flame. So it's a scenario that is already considered when you consider the smallest fire. Because remember, we're bounding. All we're doing is trying to find what are the fires that effectively could do what they did. In your simple analysis that you did in your main report, it was based on a calculation from um, Dougal Drysdale, which was based on a fire in an open space. Is that yes. correct? Do you agree that other aspects of that Drysdale paper deal with fires closer to a wall or in a corner? Yes. So basically, uh, if, if you look at, uh, at uh, Dougal Drysdale's book, you will find that he will produce different equations for fires in a wall, fires around a corner. But in all those cases, the flame will be taller. So effectively, it will be already included in my bounding analysis. I'm just setting the boundary. So all, if I did all those refinements, I will find points that are already included in my two uh, limits. So that was my next question. Does your modeling take account of that? Yes, because effectively you are looking at the smallest possible and the biggest possible. So everything is already, all the in-betweens that are more precise are already included.
So you don't accept that your simple model should have referred to those other Drysdale calculations? No, no. I mean, it's, uh, you, know, you could do it just as a further validation to show that, uh, that they fall in between. But the CFD model already does all that. So effectively, if I'm already running the CFD model, there is really no point in using, again, simple calculations for a situation that I have already uh, calculated. And you've also looked at variability in ventilation in the kitchen with different windows open and closed. Uh, that includes the large window in the open tilt position and the small window open. Is that correct? Yes. And you've said that this produces a peak heat release rate of about 400 kilowatts, which can be sustained. Yes. Can we just look at what you say in your report about this? Can we go to, um, it's on page 152, JTOS. Six zeros one. Can we zoom in on lines three four three one to three four three eight? So there you say results presented in figure eighty eight indicate that for the large window in the tilted position and the small window fully open, a peak heat release rate of approximately four hundred kilowatts can be sustained. This means that a larger fire will result in a higher overall compartment temperatures, as shown on figure eighty nine, as there's more air available to support combustion. Again, can does that mean that there's any difficulty with your simple model of sixty to, to three hundred kilowatts? Uh, no, all, all that it means is that um, the model says that if I put 400, if I open the window, the heat release rate will increase a little bit. Now, the model says that it's 400 kilowatts, but that level of precision is not granted. So all we can say is that the temperatures that I gave are approximately right, but they could be potentially slightly bigger if, um, if the window was open. And do you think it makes much difference whether it's 300 kilowatts or 400 kilowatts? I mean, um, well, it, it does make a difference, but it, when you say it makes much difference, I think you have to uh, ask that question in the context. It makes much difference for what? We'll and and I this. think that's yeah. that's the important question. So, so in in some cases it will make a difference, and then at that point I will have to say this model is not sufficient to do that. But for other things, it doesn't make any difference because we are way outside the ranges, for example. So, and as you go on to say, um, on the same page, uh, in the next paragraph, we've got it here on the screen, <coughs> models were run to analyze the difference in thermal profiles created by the opening of the small kitchen window in addition to the, the, the large tilted kitchen window. The results shown in figure 95 indicate that there's little difference between the two, with the lower ventilation resulting in only slightly higher temperatures attributable to the lower heat, heat losses from the compartment. So that's yes. what you were just explaining. Can yeah. we just look at that in figure 95? I think it will help to look at that. That's JTOS 601 at page 153. Now here, we, basically this is showing between the, the continuous lines and the dotted lines, the difference between whether the small window is open or closed. Is that correct? Yes. So in case one, uh, the small window is closed, but in case two, the small window's open. And can you just explain why you're saying this shows that there's little difference between yeah. those two scenarios? So, so basically, given the coarseness of the inputs that go into this model, you will consider all those lines to be the same. And the way you will normally represent that is that will be an average plus an error of about 10 to 15 degrees at both sides. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there is really not much of a significant difference other than a slight trend upwards. But effectively, given the inputs that we're putting, I could not ascertain that, the, that even that difference is actually that real. So I will normally what I will do in, in a plot of that nature is average everything, give a single plot, and put an error bar of plus minus 10 degrees. So just testing that then, what about potential gaps around the doors? So there's the sliding door to the kitchen. It, 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 and then there's also the kitchen door itself. Is it possible that the doors would not have provided a complete seal? And could that have made a difference? Um, it would have made a very, very minor difference. I mean, uh, generally leaks uh, will be considered as being a much, much smaller 
uh, flow rate than an open window. I mean, clearly the one thing that does make a big difference is an open door, and, uh, and, and that has to be taken into account. But leakages are lower in the pecking order than an open window. An open window will be a much, much more. So if an open window can change things by 10 or 15 degrees, I would imagine that leakages will not change it by one or two degrees. And what about evidence from witnesses of drafts around the windows and from under the doors post-refurbishment? Again, would you think that that could change the results in your modelling? No. The, again, it will fall way within the category of noise. And what if the doors were not fully <clears throat> shut? Could that affect your modelling? Uh, when you say not fully shut, I mean, if you're talking about 5%, it's going to be a very, very small gap, and therefore, again, it will make no difference. But if you're talking about 20%, 30%, then, of course, as you start opening the door, then you're making a very significant uh, And that's area. where you got to flash over scenario. And that's when you get to yeah. flash over. What about if the extractor fan was in the on mode and sucking... Uh, air out of the kitchen again could that make a difference uh, well that again it will make a slight difference now if you look at the typical flow rates of an extractor fan in general they're very small compared to the types of flow rates that you will get uh, by smoke production or by egress uh, of smoke out of the, the a door so Im Im imagine what you see when you have a fire and you open a window you see an enormous amount of smoke coming out so that is clearly much, much more than what a fan can, can extract. So, of course, all these things will make a slight difference, but it will not be a significant difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you agree that if you did allow for some additional ventilation, such as around the doors, um, and for the possibility that the fire was not positioned in the center of the room but was against a wall or in a corner, that there might be local areas within the smoke layer, for example at ceiling level, where the fire could have reached approximately 550 degrees C? Would you accept that? Yes. But can you explain why you've not taken that account in, in, in your modeling, or have you taken that into no, account? No, we, we have taken it into account. So basically, we made a clear distinction between heating by means of the smoke and heating by means of flame impingement. So what you're talking about uh, of hot spots, localized heating areas, is effectively the flame in itself reaching that location and creating a hotter area within the smoke layer. So the conclusion that we came up with is that the temperatures that the smoke layer can reach cannot reach the typical ignition temperatures of most of these materials. You know, but the flames, if they actually touch any of these components, uh, will actually reach those temperatures. Now, we did a detailed analysis uh, of that. I'm coming to that. Is that about spill pollutant the spill temperatures? Pollutant. Yeah, the I'm coming to that next. Yeah. Before we get to that, can you just explain why you used an average smoke layer temperature in your modeling? Yes, because you, you have to differentiate two things. One is the smoke, and one is the flame impingement. So I wanted to separate both. So if the smoke gets hot enough that it can ignite the components, that basically means any component within the room could have ignited when it enters the smoke layer. Now, if the smoke layer cannot reach those temperatures, that basically means that only the, air, the, the components that were in reach of the flames could have ignited. So that allows me to establish how far the fire can be before it cannot touch any combustible material. So I'm separating the two things yeah. to make sure that I establish what is igniting what. Yeah. Is it also right that you've used a steady state fire in your CFD modeling as opposed to a growing fire? Yes. And why have you done that? Because what we were testing with the CFD was effectively if there was enough oxygen to burn. So there was no point in increasing the fire. You just put it at the maximum value and see if you have enough oxygen to burn. So it, many times you use different modeling strategies depending on what you're testing. And because in this case, what we were testing is, do we have enough oxygen? Then I want to fix the fire at the maximum and see if I actually have enough oxygen or the fire starts going down on its own because it doesn't have enough oxygen to yeah. burn. Yeah. So let's turn, we're nearly finished with the modeling, but let's turn to the the external spill plume temperatures. Yes. So you've done some modeling which assists in terms of what you refer to as these external spill 
plume temperatures. And those are temperatures if the fire had vented out of the kitchen window. Is that correct? Yes, but that's different to what I was talking about, which is the flame impingement. Yes. Okay. Can you just explain the difference? No, no. The, there's three things. So there's when, when, when you have the, the compartment, yeah. okay, you're going to produce a smoke layer. So the smoke has a certain temperature. Within the smoke, there will be the fire. And the fire can penetrate the smoke sometimes and get hotter in a certain region. So there's a whole section of my report when I discuss this, what I call the ceiling jet temperatures. So it's effectively how far the flames can reach. It's not the hot smoke temperature, it is the flame itself touching. And then the third one is what is happening to the outside, and that's the spill plume. So you have a compartment that has hot smoke, and the hot, hot smoke will come out of the compartment, mix with cold air, and that will create a spill plume. Now, on the external spill plume yes. temperatures analysis, you say that this shows that smoke temperature would only reach this is smoke temperature would only reach temperatures capable of igniting the ACP cladding if there was a large fire size with ventilation able to support it and thus under post flashover conditions. Is that correct? Yes. And in general, you've said that this more sophisticated modelling confirms your confidence in the simple model. Is that correct? Yes. Do you think it's likely that you'd like to do more modelling at phase two? Uh, I, I do think that the uh, modelling will only become necessary as a function of more detailed testing. So there is a need, if, if there is a need to refine um, what are the, con the exact conditions that led to ignition of the external system, you know, then tests will have to be done before modeling because you have to produce the right input data yeah. so that you actually get, a, uh, it is justifiable to do a more precise model. Yeah. Now I'm coming on to look at the role of the UPVC window surrounds and that section of your report I think you were just talking about. Yes. Um, but before we leave this, this modeling topic, um, I just have a question about table seven of your report. Can we just go to that? That's JTOS 601 at page 140. Now, in that table, you've summarized some of the results from your zone modeling. And in the fourth substantive line, you've got a smoke filling time of 50 seconds for an ultra fast fire with a corresponding peak heat release rate of 360 kilowatts. Is that right? Yes. We look in the fourth line down and the last of the ones under scenario one. Is it right that this does not use the standard heat release rate calculation from an ultra fast fire, which would result in a figure of 470 kilowatts? Yeah, so uh, there's a confusion on, on what does 475 is. So the, the, when we use an input, we utilize a standard, um, what is called an alpha T squared fire. So effectively, we plug in a time and we get a heat release rate. But that is the input, that's the fuel that we're putting in there. What this model does, it calculates how much it's burning. So what happens is that I am inputting 475, but at some point the model stops me because it says I don't have enough air. And it stops me at 360. And as you can see, for all the cases when I try to push it, in all the cases, it will pretty much stop at the same place because that's the air, amount of air that is available. Mm -hmm. So you can see in the first, uh, in, the, in the far right uh, column, you will see 350, 355, 360, 360, because that's where it tells you this is as much air as I have. Now, when I open the door, now I have as much air as 1550, and then I can get much more. So, so we cannot confuse the input with the output. Yeah. So what is being presented there is the output that incorporates fuel and oxygen while the number that you quoted is the input, but I cannot burn all that fuel because I don't have enough air. So let's turn now to the section of your report where you've looked at the role of the UPVC window surrounds. Um, when looking at the breaching of the compartment, you focus quite heavily on the role of the UPVC around the windows. In general, can you just explain why you've done that? Yes, because the, the UPVC serves as a cover for a whole array of other materials that potentially could burn. Now, UPVC is a material that, from a flammability perspective, is a very robust material. It's a material that is very difficult to burn. 
So in principle, it could potentially be an adequate protection layer uh, you know, for uh, these materials. Uh, nevertheless, um, the UPVC has a particularity, which is that it loses its mechanical strength at very low temperatures. So effectively, can actually fall off. And uh, so this is a reason why I thought it was very important to focus on the UPVC. Yeah. You, you've explained in your report that it has a melting range of between 75 and 105 degrees C. Yes. Is that correct? And it rapidly loses stiffness at 60 degrees Celsius. Is yes. that right? And it loses 80% by 80 degrees and 100% by 90 degrees. Yes. Can we just look at table one of your report? That's JTOS 601 at page 37. Can, can I just ask you, when it <coughs> gets to 90 degrees, 100 degrees centigrade, does it actually flow? Um, no, it will behave like gum. Right. So it, 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 it does flow, but it's very, very viscous. <coughs> so it, yeah. it, it, it is more like a, a gum. So in this table, you've given various material properties of a number of materials that are important in terms of the, the, the kitchen. Um, can you just explain here what we see for the, the UPVC in the bottom two lines? Yes, so what you see for the UPVC are two characteristics. One is its ignition temperature, and the second one is the melting temperature. And uh, you can see that the melting temperature is, 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 is of the order of 100 degrees, you know, while the ignition temperature is almost 400 degrees. Yeah. And while we're here, what we see on the top line, we see polyethylene. That's the material that was inside the ACM panels. Yes. Is that correct? And you put that there, that has an ignition temperature of 377 degrees C. Is that yes. right? And that's just the polyethylene, is that right? Yes. It's not related to the aluminium will come later to the, yep. the panels. And then we have PIR, which is um, effectively insulation yes. in, the, in the second column. And you've got that with an ignition temperature of 306 to 377 degrees C. Is that correct? Yes. Now, in terms of the UPVC, you've talked about the fact that it has this elastic modulus, which is of importance, which I think what you were just describing. Can we just look at that? Let's look at figure nine of your report. That's JTOS 601 at page 41. Can you just describe for us what we see here and what the different, the red and the blue lines are? We've got blue is the, the modulus, I think. Yep. Can you just explain what that is and also what the red line is showing? Yes, uh, so this is a, a, a test conducted by Professor Bisbee and basically shows you what is the, uh, the, the module, the elastic modulus for uh, UPVC at ambient, which is 2.5 times 10 to the 9. And, um, and you can see that as you start increasing the temperature, um, sorry, it was uh, at ambient temperature, it's about, yeah, a little bit above 2. two times 10 to the 9. So as you start increasing the temperature, uh, what happens is that the value starts dropping. So that's the blue line. So you get a decaying value that uh, eventually hits zero. So in other words, it has no strength by the time it gets to about 80, uh, 90 degrees. And uh, by 100, clearly has uh, nothing left. So that will be the blue line. And uh, what the red line is, it just shows you the rate at which that happens. So what you can see is that at the beginning, there's very little change. So you can see it's flat, very little change. And then eventually, it starts changing drastically. And that happens at about 60 degrees. So what, what you're looking for on the red line is when it starts going up, because that's telling you when it starts to change. What you're looking for on the blue line is when it ends because that tells you when it doesn't have any more strength. So between 60 and 100 degrees, you effectively are going from having almost its full strength to having no strength. And you said in your report that, that most fires originating from fuels typical of a domestic kitchen will have the capacity to significantly damage the UPVC. Is that right? Absolutely, because if, if, if we go back to the original discussion that we were having, we established that we needed a fire of the size of a frying pan to be able to, um, uh, to bring the smoke layer to the floor, and that was the limits 
in which we were operating. So this particular fire could not be bigger than, than a frying pan. And, uh, and so then if you look at the smoke layer temperature, the smoke layer temperature is around at the most 200 degrees. So it cannot ignite anything. But nevertheless, it's 100 degrees above the temperature that you need to basically take the PVC down. In other words, it loses all its mechanical properties. Now, we did a detailed heat transfer calculation, actually a very conservative one, and we showed we had plenty of time to heat the UPVC to the point where we would have lost all its mechanical integrity. So this is very important because, again, it separates, and this is the reason behind the strategy that we follow for modeling. So it separates the smoke temperature from the flame temperatures. So the smoke cannot ignite anything but it can actually mechanically fail the UPVC. To ignite things, we need a flame. Yeah. And you've said in your report that the UPVC would have reached temperatures with a total lock loss of mechanical strength in approximately five to 11 minutes, is that right? Yes. And you also say that the kitchen is sufficiently small that it doesn't matter where in the room the fire is to cause that total loss of mechanical strength, is that Ex right? Exactly, so with the CFD and all the other validations that we did, we showed that effectively the very simple model that doesn't take into account spatial resolution, uh, in other words, you can place it anywhere you want, uh, will effectively be sufficient to be able to establish that. Yeah. You've noted in your report that the UPVC is held in place by an adhesive, a kind of glue, which you also say is vulnerable to, to heating. Um, you say the ability to secure the UPVC at elevated temperatures is considered negligible. Can we, can we just look at that? If we go to figure 55 of your report, that's JTOS 601 at 0042. So is, is this what, what we're seeing here is underneath the UPVC surround, is that correct? Yes. And can you just draw attention to the adhesive? Is it the bottom label there? Yeah, so it's the bottom label, and you can see the, the mark of the, of the adhesive. So adhesive is a polymer, and it will actually behave in a very similar way as a UPVC. It will lose all its mechanical integrity by the time it gets to about 60, 70 degrees. So effectively, both the adhesive and the PVC will have no mechanical strength. So the adhesive has no capacity to keep the UPVC in place, and the weight of the UPVC uh, is much more than what the UPVC can hold itself. And what we can see the remnants <coughs> of under there are the PIR foam insulation, which was all the way round the windows, is that correct? Yes. Uh, top, bottom, left, right, yeah. And what is your view about this arrangement in terms of any potential path of fire spread out of the window? Well, effectively, the, the smoke, even though its temperature is very low, uh, is capable with a big margin of safety you know, to mechanically fail the UPVC. So it opens a direct path for any flame to actually impinge on any of the combustible materials on the inside. Just on this topic, can we just look at some of the photos that you've used in your report to illustrate the failure of the UPVC that we saw at Grenfell Tower? Uh, can we go to JTOS 601 at page 43 to start with? So let's just, can we just zoom in in the top one for the moment? So you said in your report that the failures are usually around the head and the jam. Can you explain what you mean by the head and the jam by reference to these photographs? So you, you can see uh, the piece of UPVC uh, hanging in there and you see where it came from. So effectively this will rip off downwards, you know, falling all the way to the bottom. That's kind of what I meant. And can you explain, you've also used the word fall off in this context. Is that just yep. it falls off? It fall, falls off. So it basically first starts the forming and then eventually it falls off. And you see it more clearly in the, in the, in the next photograph. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I'm now going to turn to a different topic. Did, did you want to show us the next photograph? Oh, I don't uh, yeah, if you can. Sorry, yeah. um, mm. let's finish these photographs. So, yes, let's go to the one at the bottom of the page. So you can see at the top how it's fallen off. And I believe there's actually one on the next page as well, if we can go to that. Yes, you can see it on the side, and, uh, and in th th this case, it's also on the top. Hmm. Yes, thank you, sorry. So 
So I think that's a convenient moment for a break. Would it be a good idea? Yes, yes I think it would. Okay. I think we'll all have a break now, Professor. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask you, I think, not to talk to anyone about your evidence while you're out in the room. And then if you go with the usher, she'll look after you. We'll come back at half past 11. Okay. Thank you very much. You go with the usher. Now. Half past eleven, please.
Good. All right, Professor, ready to carry on? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yes, it's great. Yes, thank you. So I now want to turn to the topic of the breakout of the fire from flat 16 and the method of ignition of the facade materials. Um, I'm going to give a trigger warning at this point because in about five to ten minutes I'm going to be showing a video mm -hmm. of the early stages of the fire at Grenfell Tower going up the east face from flat 16. This contains images and audio that some may find distressing. Yeah. I will also be taking Professor Torero to a number of stills and photographs of the fire in this section of my questioning. Right. So I will give another warning when I yeah. get to that video, but I wanted to give it now in case anyone wants to be prepared for that. Thank you, that's very helpful. Now in your section 3.5 of your report, um, first of all, just to be clear, you have not addressed cause and origin of the fire in your report, which is dealt with by other inquiry experts. Is that correct? Yes, I've taken the information from uh, Professor Magnid and, and Professor Bisbee on that matter. Thank you. <coughs> have you considered the different hypotheses which have been posited by Professor Bisbee in terms of the method of ignition of the cladding materials on the facade? Yes. Now, in his latest report, Professor Bisbee discusses two particular hypotheses. First, what is now called hypothesis B1, which is essentially the impingement of flaming and hot gases through an open window, whether that be through the extract panel or via the extract fan itself, and then subsequent ignition of the external ACM panels immediately above the kitchen window. Is that correct? Yes. And he's also discussed what's now called hypothesis B2, which is the ignition by flame of, the, of exposed flammable materials in the window surround and the external cladding system being penetrated by fire, fire, allowing flame spread back into the back of the cladding cavity. Is that correct? Yes. Do you agree that these are the two possible routes of ignition out and into the cladding? Yes. Do you think there are any other plausible candidates for that? Uh, they, they are clearly the two most probable uh, causes. So I just want to start by discussing hypothesis B1, the venting through the window opening and up into the panels above the window. So I think as we discussed just before the break, does it remain your view that the smoke itself is not going to be hot enough for the smoke that's venting through the, the window opening to ignite the cladding? Yes. You say that the maximum temperature of the smoke layer is around 220 degrees Celsius, even with an ultra-fast fire, is that correct? Yes. So ignition of the materials even surrounding the window, specifically the PIR insulation, which is behind the UPVC, that requires 306 degrees Celsius, is that right? Yes. Now, you've calculated that direct ignition via direct flame or plume impingement through the window would require a fire of around 830 kilowatts to ignite the ACP through the window. Is that correct? Yes. Can you just explain for the chairman how you've calculated that? Yep. Uh, so, ba 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 basically, um, if we provide enough ventilation to allow the temperature of the flames uh, to reach those those, those temperatures, uh, you can establish what is the heat release rate that will deliver the necessary temperatures so that you can ignite the cladding from the outside. And uh, the one thing that, um, uh, that is very different about both hypotheses, <coughs> and, uh, and may maybe this is a time to clarify that, is that uh, when we have a compartment fire, the compartment is always going to be hotter than the plume outside. Mm -hmm. So from a physical perspective, uh, a path that ignites from the inside uh, is a more, more probable uh, cause of ignition because the temperatures are always going to be higher uh, in, in the inside than in the outside. Now, uh, Professor Bisbee comes from a different angle, which is also perfectly possible, which is once something ignites, that something can create a flame, and that flame can be the one that results in the ignition of the subsequent materials. Now, he's coming from the observation so he's looking at different images, and he's basically looking at the different flames that are moving in different directions. And he is observing that there is a high probability that a flame could have impinged 
you know, on the external cladding. So the, the two options and the way that we are giving to the two options, and the reason why I didn't feel there was any need for me to clarify any further in my report, is because we are coming from different angles, and, and I believe that the chairman needs to consider both, in the sense that one comes from a purely physical analysis of the problem that shows that the hotter part and the closest to a, a flame will be from the inside, but the other one is more a probabilistic one, is what ignited first. And if there is a sequence of ignitions that resulted in a flame, that could have perfectly be the case of igniting on the outside. But that comes more from observations of images and observations of evidence. Yeah. It might be helpful at this point to look at your table three. That's JTOS 601 at page 50. If we can zoom in on the table at the top of the page. <coughs> so can you just talk us through, just in basic terms, what this table is showing us in terms of fire size and distance and the, these three materials? Yeah, so ba basically what, what you see in the, in, in the table is, uh, depending on the location of the material and its ignition characteristics, uh, we looked uh, into having a flame. And maybe, maybe we should look at the diagram first. Mm -hmm. Is that figure 14? That would be... Or is it figure 13? Which one? Uh, it would be figure 13, that will be... Yeah, so if we go to JTOS 601 at 0047, page 47. And if we can zoom in on figure 13 at the bottom. Okay. Is that what you're referring yes. to? So basically, those are the two potential options. So you can have a fire that is unobstructed, that uh, directly impinges on a target. And that target could be the PIR or the UPVC or the, the cladding. So we know what the position of these components is. So we can establish what the distance is between the fire and the target. So on the basis of that, I can establish how big of a fire do I need so that the flame at the position of the target has sufficient temperature to ignite. Okay? And if there's an obstacle, then the flames will have to go to the ceiling, then to progress along the ceiling and effectively hit the target. So given that the smoke cannot ignite, it has to be direct impingement from the flame. Mm -hmm. So what we looked into was, uh, given the position of the fire, how big of a fire we had to have to be able to ignite the targets, and that's what you have on, on the table. Yeah. And you just talked about the phenomenon of a, a ceiling jet that might yes. occur behind an object. So the fire goes up behind the object and then across the ceiling and out yeah. towards the window. How likely do you think that might have been here? Well, if the, if the fire was established behind any obstacle, that would have had to be the case, because effectively it had to go through the obstacle before it reaches the target. So the only way that that could have happened is going up, hitting the ceiling, and then propagating across the ceiling uh, towards the target. So okay. it will be highly probable. Can I just ask you to consider a slightly different hypothesis, which is that the fire is <coughs> breaks out behind an obstacle, but to the side of the target. So in other words, it doesn't have to go over the obstacle to get to the target. It might go at a different angle. It would be bounded by, e by the two of them. So this is the worst case scenario and the other one is the best case scenario. Yeah. So, so you will be somewhere in between. Yeah. And so that's why we're giving the two ranges. Yeah. So this helps explain what we see in your table three, exactly. is that correct? Do you want to just go back to that now? Yes. Yeah, so if we just go back to table three, which is on page 50. So if you can now just talk us through for each of the elements what yes. we're seeing. So, so we know uh, how big a fire can be now because we've done the analysis. So if we take that size of a fire, then the distance that you see there 
is how far do I need to move the fire away from the target before it cannot reach the ignition temperature. So, and that's where we see the figure of 830 kilowatts. That uh, that's where you see the, the maximum distance. Yeah. The, the final column. Yeah. But I put to you the smallest fire, 830 kilowatts, yeah, would be that needed will be the, to needed. ignite the polyethylene yes. at the top of yeah. the window. Exactly. And you say that's a flashover fire, so you think that's unlikely. Yes. In terms of direct flame impingement through an open window, is it therefore relevant that the flames would have fed out into the open atmosphere outside the, the flat? Yes, it would have had to ignite something in between because the flame would have been had to be placed closer to the opening to be able to be smaller and still reach the ignition temperatures of the cladding. And does the flame get cooled in the process of coming out of an open window? And is that relevant to the analysis of whether or not that's a likely method of impingement? Yes, so the, the, the moment the flame exits the compartment, there's going to be fresh air and that's going to cool the temperatures of the flame. So it's going to, uh, it is always going to be the case that the spill flame is going to be colder than the interior compartment. Uh, it cannot be the opposite. So, uh, so yeah, so that, that will definitely influence the analysis. Now, but again, I, I, I want to make this point again, you know, that, that um, uh, in this particular type of scenarios, because we're talking about flames that can impinge on numerous things. There can be a sequence of ignitions. Mm -hmm. So one thing can ignite another one and it can ignite another one. So, and those things you can only uh, ascertain by looking into what the visual evidence that you have. Yes. So I think uh, when comparing my conclusions with Professor Bisbee's conclusions, we have to make sure that we understand that I did not do the detailed analysis of the images. That's what he did. And, uh, and he didn't do the detailed analysis of the fire dynamics, which is what I did. And the two things complement each other. I see, yeah. Can we just look for a moment about what the method of impingement might have been for the ACP panels above the window? Can we look at a picture of what we see above the window? Can we go to figure 40 of Professor Bisbee's report? That's LBYS601 at page 68. Yes, now this is a good photograph which shows you what you see. We, now, just to make clear, the, the ACM material on the column has been removed here to the left of the picture. But to the right, we're looking directly up um, from the window to the ACM cassettes that were immediately ab above. Is that correct? Yes. And we see there that the way the cassettes were fabricated is there was a 90 degree return and then a, a kind of level yes. underneath the window, immediately underneath, uh, above the extractor fan, is that yep. correct? Can we also look at another picture? That's a picture from Dr. Lane's report. That's BLAS 5010 at page 26, figure 10.26. <laughs> this is a, a, another photograph of uh, the window. This is to the right-hand side of the window, and we can see those cassettes above, and she's put a ring in there, which we'll come to in a moment. But just looking at these photos, what do you think the mechanism could have been for igniting those ACM cassettes above the window if the flames had vented out through an open window? Well, I mean, you need to ignite uh, the polyethylene that has a specific temperature that you need to attain. And not only that, the polyethylene is a thin film that is in between two aluminum plates. The aluminum plates have very high thermal conductivity, so they take a lot of energy away from the polyethylene. So normally, these type of materials are actually quite difficult to ignite because what happens is that the heat that you apply goes away through the polyethylene, through the aluminum, and the polyethylene tends to melt instead of igniting. So it requires a significant amount of heat to be able to ignite these panels. Now, the mechanism would have been that eventually, either through melting or through splitting, 
you would have had a surface of the polyethylene that is exposed. A flame would have creeped in there, and that's what would have ignited the, the material. Are there any exposed <coughs> edges of polyethylene above the window? Uh, I would imagine that there would be. I mean, Dr. Lane has some, I think, marked here on yes. the, the right-hand side. Does that affect the analysis in terms of whether or not there are those Well, if edges? there will be no exposed edges, it will be even more difficult to ignite because you will have to breach the encapsulation of the material. Uh, and so all those details will have some impact on the way it ignites. Uh, but one that it would be very, very difficult to predict. If this had been the mechanism of fire spread, would you have expected a time delay, given the factors you were just talking about, when compared with other possible routes? Not necessarily. Now, can we just look at the thermal imaging uh, from flat 16, uh, which indicates that the fire may have vented from the window in the corner of the room? If we go again within Dr. Lane's report to BLAS 609 at page 43, can we go to figure 9.37? So in the image at the top, we have a still from the thermal imaging that was taken. Is that correct? Yes. Does this image help at all, in your view, about what the route of escape may have been? through the window? Uh, not from my perspective, because it is too late. So 114, I believe, is that uh, thermal image camera footage. And, uh, and at that point, uh, you would have been already at least about 10 minutes into the event. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as you saw from all the other diagrams, that is already very late in, in the whole process. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, that could have not been the moment in which, or the area in which it, it, it breached. Uh, all that that means is that inferring that back from an image that is, was taken at 114 is very difficult because it's so late in time that a lot of things would have happened in between. Do you infer anything from the thermal imaging about which side of the window would have been getting the most heat in terms of temperatures inside the compartment? Again, I mean, clearly at that point, it is clear that those are the areas that seem to be the hottest. And now, which areas, just to be clear, which areas do The you areas think? are in yellow. Yeah. And, uh, but as you can see, still the temperatures are 150 degrees. So clearly there is a concentration of heat in there, but it is more the smoke layer type of heat. Now, one of the things that, that many times uh, thermal imaging cameras uh, mislead us is that different materials have different emissivities. So while the camera might think is reading more heat, it might actually be reading less heat because it's just the material that is emitting more energy. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I wouldn't make too much uh, mm -hmm. out of that image other than the fact that there seems to be a slight concentration of heat in that area. Now you have concluded in your report that you think the most likely route of ignition of the facade is by flame of exposed flammable materials in the window surrounds, is that correct? Yes. Does that remain your view, despite reading Professor Bisbee's report? Uh, that, that remains, as I say, that remains my view from a physical perspective. I think that that, that is the case, but I do not discard by any means uh, you know, what the visual evidence might, uh, might show, because clearly, as I say, uh, you can have a random sequence of ignitions that can actually lead to an external ignition, so I cannot discard that as a possibility. Yeah. And just to be clear, can you just crystallize, summarize with why you think that's the most likely route? Uh, fundamentally, because the fire dynamics will tell you that the highest temperatures and the closest proximity to the flames is going to be in the compartment. Anything outside the compartment is going to be colder and further, unless you find a path of ignition after ignition that brings you there. And that you can only tell by a detailed analysis of, of images. Can we just be clear on what you think the most likely path is? So we've talked about the melting and deforming of the UPVC, possibly yes. via the smoke layer itself, yep. without any direct flame impingement. And then what's the next thing that you think is most likely to have ignited? Uh, that's impossible to say, because all the materials in there will, be, will have ignition temperatures that are lower than the, ignition, than, the, than the temperatures that the flame could provide. So effectively, you will create, as soon as, uh, as the flame reaches a certain size, 
you will create a condition by which any of those materials could ignite. What materials are we talking about here? Let's just be clear what the candidates are. We've got, we talked before by reference to the photograph of immediately behind the UPVC, we have the insulation, yes. the small layer of insulation that we have top, bottom, left and right. Is that correct? That's PIR insulation yes. around the window. And then we also have an EDPM membrane on the column yes. side. Do you think those two are both candidates for and, the And so, so is the UPVC. Itself? Of course. Yes. And there, from there, if those materials had ignited around the window sides, let's take the column side, so we've got the insulation, we have the EDPM membrane, what happens then in terms of the column? What's next? So, so then you will get flames into a cavity, and, uh, and effectively you are affecting uh, the ACM panel, you're affecting everything, so uh, what follows after will be just the progression of the fire through uh, the space, and it could come out uh, as easy as it went in. So, so in principle, the sequence that follows after uh, is, again, almost impossible to detail step by step. But, but all the different components, as you could see in the, in the previous photograph that you show, they're all so much in proximity that uh, there, there is no question that there will be a sequence of ignitions of all of them. Yeah. So you think all of those will have ignited as part of the path yes. out? And it's right, isn't it, that there were no cavity barriers around the windows? Uh, I don't believe so. And, and you've calculated that a fire with characteristics similar to that of a kitchen fire, if placed within three metres of the window, is capable of igniting those combustible materials adjacent to the window. Is that correct? Uh, yes. And for example, you've said in your report that a fire at floor level of just 20 kilowatts is capable of igniting materials at windowsill level, i.e. at the lower parts of the level. Yes. And again, what materials are we talking about there? Uh, in, it, it could be, basically, we took as a, a reference the ignition temperatures of all of them, so it could have ignited any of them. Yep. And as you say, you've also looked at fires behind an obstacle because of the fact that it may have been behind the fridge, is that yes, correct? Yes, where the two bounding, so the fire that is unobstructed is the <coughs> smallest possible fire and the other extreme will be the one that is fully confined behind an obstacle. Yeah. And in terms of that fire we were just discussing, behind an obstacle and then a ceiling jet across the ceiling, you've noted in your report that there was a strip of pearl board, yes. a kind of legacy strip of, of pearl board above the window on the flat side of the window before you got to the UPVC surround. Yes. Is that something that you remain interested in? Yes, because obviously that will be the one that will be in closest proximity you know, to a flame, so it will be the first one to be affected. So you think it's possible that the ceiling jet may have impinged on that first and then onto the UPVC or the insulation? Yes. And do you think that's something that should be the subject of further consideration and testing at phase two? I mean, I think that, that clearly uh, it is important to try to have as many pieces of the puzzle as possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, nevertheless, the importance to the overall um, outcome of what was the, the first thing to catch on fire uh, is probably not that significant. And it's right, isn't it, that the different materials around the window would have had different thermal inertias, is that yes. correct? And that's the speed at which they flame, speed at which they pyrolyze and release combustible gases. Yeah, it's the speed at which they can absorb energy towards ignition. And if something has a low thermal inertia, does that mean it's first to ignite compared to something with a material of a high thermal inertia? Yes, a material with low thermal inertia will ignite much faster. And is it right that the PIR insulation would have had the lowest thermal inertia of any of those materials that we were just discussing? Yes. And is it right that the polyethylene would have had the highest thermal inertia? Yes. Do those thermal inertia values assist in working out which is likely to have been the route of ignition? Not clearly. They, they just give you an, an, an estimate uh, of what could have gone first, but these numbers are only valid in the sense that they had to be under exactly the same conditions. So if you have a flame <coughs> impinging on the polyethylene, but 
10 centimeters away from the PIR, the polyethylene will ignite faster than the PIR. So the way in which the fire evolves and how it interacts with these materials is really the dominant function. I mean, what we're talking about here is a, is a very small fire being capable of igniting any of the things. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate question. Now, what the sequence is and all the details is extremely difficult because while they are related to all these material properties, they're much more related to where the flame was in relationship to the material. Yeah. Again, just to test this a little bit more, what about the, the aluminium skins that we have on different materials? You've talked previously when we looked at the ACM cassettes that they had an aluminium skin that may well have been relevant in terms of whether it was first to ignite. Um, what about the PIR and the foil that is on the, the PIR? The, the foil on the PIR, and in as much as the aluminum skin, are going to have an impact in trying to slow down ignition. That's, that's clear. Um, the, the aluminum being thicker, the aluminum skin of the ACM being thicker, obviously has a bigger impact. So it is actually quite difficult to ignite an ACM panel. And, um, and, and, but all these things, again, you know, they do have an impact. So obviously exposed PIR will be more susceptible to ignition than PIR covered by an aluminum film. And just <clears throat> to help me with this, um, is the purpose of the, because it's a very thin skin of uh, aluminum, isn't it, on the PIR, is its function to dissipate the heat or to exclude the oxygen or what? Uh, <coughs> it's, it's, its function is to actually, is not to dissipate the heat in this case, uh, although it does have a reflective uh, mm -hmm. So part of the heat gets reflected mm -hmm. out. Uh, its function is mostly to separate the fuel from the oxidizer. So that, that delays uh, the whole process of ignition because once the material reaches the point where it starts evaporating, then it still has to reach uh, the oxygen before it ignites and the barrier serves to block that transfer. Okay. Right. Thank you. Do you think that the exposed sides of the insulation in the columns, so they had a foil face, but they had exposed sides, might be significant in this context? Well, they, they, they are going to change the outcome and, uh, in, in the sense that, that the exposed sides will ignite faster than the areas that are not exposed. Uh, but in this context, uh, I think given, as I say, the proximity of all these materials, the complexity of the cavity, and the nature of the fire event, uh, it's extremely difficult you know, to figure out to what extent that would have mattered or not. Yeah. Can we just look a picture, at, at a picture of that, just to orientate ourselves on that? So uh, if we go to figure 8.37 in Dr. Lane's report, that's BLAS 608 at page 35. So this is a picture where we can see the column insulation, which was 100 millimeters with the full skin, we, the ACM column panels have been taken off, so we see it inside, and we can see the exposed edge there. Is that what you were just talking about? Yes. And you're saying, therefore, that may have played a slight difference in terms of if it's got into the column, you've got an exposed edge or potentially an exposed edge there. Yes, but uh, again, you know, going back to the point that I was making, you will see also uh, other materials involved a very intricate geometry. Mm -hmm. You know, if from, from an idealized perspective, a designer would like to be able to model performance. So I would like to be able to create some calculations that allow me to tell you what the performance is of the system. Here we have designed and built a system that we've made it so intricate and complex that we have no capacity to be able to predict performance. So when we are discussing these little details, we have to put that into context, that effectively this is such a complex system that being able to say this is how it went and this is the direction and it jumped from here to here is a complete impossibility because the system is way too complex. Yeah. Can we also look at figure 10.10 .10 of Dr. Lane's report? That's BLAS 5010. Yes, yeah, so here what we're seeing is we're looking at the column that's focused on the right. We're looking at some of the column cassettes that were, sorry, the, the, the column panels that were um, the ACM panels on, on the columns, covering those columns. 
and we can see that she's highlighted some exposed PE cores where it's been cut mm -hmm. in relation to those columns. Again, do you think that that could have been significant in terms of the route of fire spread out uh, of flat 16? Again, you know, all those elements are, uh, are potentially uh, significant. They could potentially have an influence. You know, but once again, I mean, look at the complexity of the system. Uh, being able to predict uh, to what extent it mattered, um, to me, is completely overwhelmed by the fact that you have a very small fire in the interior that can actually have the capacity to ignite any of these components. That, at the end, remains to me the, the bottom line. The details uh, are very, very difficult to articulate in a separate way. I now want to turn to the visual evidence, which, as you say, Professor Bisbee has considered in a lot of detail. Um, and I'm about to play Professor Bisbee's video, so I just want to repeat the trigger warning at this point. I'm now going to be showing a video of the early stages of the fire at Grenfell Tower, uh, up the east face. This contains images and audio that some may find distressing, and I'm then going to be asking you about a number of stills that we see in relation to that visual evidence. I'm going to just play the first part of the video, approximately eight <coughs> minutes, and we're going to look at the time period between 1.05 and 1.17 in this video. We're going to stop it there. So if I can now... Right, no, should we just pause for a minute? Because, well, I can't see anyone making to leave this room, but there might be people in the overflow room who might want Understood. to get out. Right, should we go on then? Yes, so if I can now play that video. shift but I'm seeing the ends a light I don't know whose yard that is but that's someone's yard getting smoked I'll be pissed if that was my yard underneath or on top or sideways mud look at that though it stinks mud too it's like the ends Fire 
fire brigades. Look, 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 the house. Yikes. Don't make fires, kids. Parents, keep your kids away. Like, like, yeah, fire brigade. There's a fire here. Oh my god! It's getting worse! Oh my god! Above it, there must be problems, huh? Yeah. Yeah, Wow. That's why I got it. getting higher now, sure. We're going to get it to watch out the floor above it now. Yeah.
I've shown that now because that, that passage is going to be relevant to a number of topics that we're going to come to in a moment. Um, now, that visual evidence has been addressed, as you say, in Professor Bisbee's report. Can we just turn up what Professor Bisbee has said about it in particular? If we look at his report, LBYS 601, at page 145, paragraph 692, to start with. We could just zoom in on that's that's great. Yeah. So there he says, since I submitted my initial phase one expert report, additional video evidence of the early fire spread to the cladding taken from outside the tower has become available. This shows that beginning at approximately 1.11.45, molten material is burning on the upper surface, i.e. sill, of the spandrel rain screen cassettes immediately below the kitchen window of flat 16. This is coincident with external flaming venting through the hole created by the failure and movement of the extract fan and infill panel. It is considered likely that this burning material is melted PE filler from the ACM cassettes located directly above the window. It should be noted that this material could also be XPS core material from the window infill panel housing the extract fan, however I consider this less likely. Now, just pausing there, can we look, before I ask you some questions about this, at figure 65 of Professor Bisbee's report, which is a still which he's referring to there. Uh, that's at LBYS 601 at page 122, figure 65. And if we can zoom in on 65 at the bottom. So... Professor Bisbee appears to be highlighting, in particular, at this point, that uh, we have um, molten material burning immediately below the kitchen window. Is that what we can see there in this photograph, burning on the, on the edge of the kitchen window? Yep, I would agree with that. And what conclusions would you draw from the presence of that burning material in that bottom left-hand corner of the window? Uh, that clearly the ACM is already involved at that point in the fire. And do you think it likely that that burning material is melted PE filler from the ACM cassettes located directly above the window? Most likely. And does that affect your view that the most likely route of ignition is by flame of exposed <coughs> flammable materials in the window surrounds? Uh, not necessarily. I think you have to keep in mind that we're talking about 112. So if we take uh, the moment in which the fire was noticed by the, uh, the detector, uh, we're already about 17 minutes into the fire. Now, fires uh, have, before they start the period of growth, they sometimes have a very long incubation period where they might be just simply simmering in there. But they have the capacity, depending on their location, to activate the detector. So the detector could have detected the fire at that very early stage. We could have given us maybe five, six, ten minutes of incubation before the growth started. You know, in that case, uh, then that conclusion will be probably most appropriate. But if the incubation period would have been very short, uh, then all the major events would have happened in the first 10 minutes. So effectively, that would have been too late and most likely would have ignited from the inside before. So there's a lot of uncertainty on the way in which the fire actually evolves at the beginning. And the fact that we had an alarm uh, doesn't necessarily tell us what was the stage of the fire and how long it would take it before it starts affecting things. And uh, in a similar manner, uh, the images is what we're seeing from the outside, so we have no capacity to see what is happening behind. So I think this is a very important piece of evidence that shows you that there is significant involvement uh, of the external uh, cladding in the fire at this point. But it is not necessarily conclusive that that is the only way in which the fire could have ignited. 
you know, because it really depends on the way the fire evolves, and that's something we will probably never know. Yeah. And when you talked a moment ago about we know we had the alarm, are you talking about the smoke alarm going yes. off in flat 16? Yeah. Can I just ask, if, if we look at that picture that's on the screen at the moment, um, would it be right to understand that the whole of the area surrounding the window is now involved in the fire? Um, Potentially, although not necessarily, cameras saturate very rapidly and then there's a smoke reflection and numerous yeah. different things. So um, at that distance, it will be quite hard to pinpoint exactly what sectors are actually burning. But uh, mm. because of the demarcation lines, it is, it is quite clear that there is a significant event going on in there. All right. Thank you. Yes, and if we can just finish off what Professor Bisbee says, then, if we can go back to LBYS 601 at page 145 and look at paragraph 693. So there he says, if the external cladding was first ignited and sustained burning due to heat from flames venting from the, from the kitchen window of flat 16, i.e. by an external fire plume, see Drysdale, one would expect to observe the earliest evidence of dripping, burning ACM PE filler originating from the location directly above the fan mounting and inward swinging kitchen window that was located directly beneath the extract fan panel. The dripping PE would most likely originate from directly above the extract fan panel. However, as already noted, the available visual evidence presented in this section suggests that dripping, burning PE spears to have first been observed falling from the base of the window as at its southernmost edge. So would you agree with Professor Bisbee in what he's saying in that paragraph about you would have expected the dripping and melting ACM had it been as a result of the flaming through the extract panel to have been dripping and melting at the top of the window, not at the bottom left-hand corner of it? Yeah, I couldn't disagree with that, uh, which doesn't mean that uh, dripping could have not been happening inside that we couldn't see. So, so in, 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 in many ways, I mean, this is a difference, you know, between, you know, putting some physical arguments and, and putting evidence from images that we need to contrast, because that's really what we have. But I think the, the points that are being made are fundamentally correct, and they stem from visual imaging, and, and it's information that is extremely valuable that should complement, you know, the analysis from the inside. But it's very difficult to put a sequence of events and say which one comes first. Yeah. Yeah, because what you're saying is you wouldn't see it well, you, if it's come around the, the inside exactly. because it may have gone inside the column and been burning there before we actually see it visually on the outside. Exactly. Can I take you back to just another image? Uh, this is an earlier image at 105 from Mr. Kibede's mobile phone. If you go in your report to JTOS 601 at page 56, line 58, 1582... And if we can focus in on that image there. So this is a screenshot taken from the video recovered from Mr. Kabede's mobile phone at timestamp 10557. Do you agree that this image appears to show flames around the extractor fan in the window of, kitchen, of the kitchen of flat 16 and a visible fire plume behind the window? Yes. And is it possible that a fire located by the wall or in the corner of Flat 16 would have produced an adhered fire plume? Uh, well, first, I guess we need to define the concept of what an well, adhered that's fire my next, plume is. What is an adhered fire plume? Uh, so so there's, when, when you have a fire, there's two types of compartment fires. Uh, the, the types of fires where you have the smoke layer that dominates the problem. In other words, what you get is gases that fill the compartment, but there's no great motion going on. In those cases, the smoke will just simply spill and it will be adhered to the wall. So effectively, you will have smoke just literally touching the walls and moving up. Now, many times, for example, when you have a door open and you have some ventilation, what you get is a flow. So the fire acts like a pump and it pushes the smoke out. 
in which case you get a disattached small you know, plume because the, pl the smoke is pushed away by the flow that gets created in the compartment. Mm -hmm. So in this particular case, given the fact that the door was closed and given the fact that most of the openings were closed, it is very unlikely that you had high velocities inside the compartment. So it will be most likely that you have an adhered fire plume. In other words, you will have the smoke touching the sticking surface. Sticking to the surface. Sticking to the surface yeah. as it's moving out. Yeah. And um, so effectively, at, at this point, you do have uh, ignition that has happened of a component that is partially in, partially out. And uh, how that happened uh, is very difficult to define. Now, the, again, the interesting thing is that this is 10 minutes from the moment of the smoke alarm. So we already have 10 minutes of, of gap happening, happening in there. So uh, as a symptom that the fire is emerging out of the compartment is a very clear symptom, but it's hard to relate to anything else beyond that. Yeah. So do you think this sheds any light on whether there might have been direct flame impingement from an adhered fire plume on the external wall materials at the head of the window. So I think what's being suggested, it comes out of the window where the extract fan's gone and sticks to the surface of the ACM cassette that we looked at before mm -hmm. that's immediately above the window and ignites it that way. Do you think that visual evidence helps on that? Well, uh, basically what you have is a flame. Now, uh, that particular flame will result in a heat flux that is applied to all that section. And effectively, it is true that the flame will impinge. Now, this in size is a fairly small flame, and it is entraining a lot of air. <coughs> so the question here will be, uh, does that flame have enough heat to be able to ignite uh, the, the, the cassette? And, and that question is one that that we have not resolved. And I do think that probably if that path is going to be followed, then that needs to be tested. Because effectively, um, it is not about having a flame. It's having a flame that is sufficiently strong yeah. to provide sufficient heat flux to be able to ignite yeah. the cassette. And just to be clear, I, I think both you and Professor Bisbee have excluded the idea that the flame could have started in the extract fan and produced sufficient heat to then ignite the panels above. Is that correct? Yeah, so bas basically, we, if, if you do a simple analysis of the size of that flame, uh, by the time you get to the cassette, even if it's adhered, uh, the heat flux will have already decayed enough that it's quite unlikely that that's what what is, is, is the, the, the only source of ignition. Now, if other things are burning around, then it's a slightly different story, you know? But because you're supporting with an extra flame an already existing amount of heat. But, uh, but just the fan by itself doesn't have the capacity to produce enough heat to be able to do that. Yeah. Just a few more questions on this topic. Um, I've been asked to put to you that there was firefighter evidence from firefighter Brown that when he was leaning out of the kitchen window and trying to squirt the hose back at the, the fire, um, that he could um, see flames traveling within the cavity. Now, that's certainly after 1.20. Is that of any assistance at all in terms of this question of breakout from the compartment? Well, the, the only information that that provides is the fact that, um, that the UPVC was gone because he could actually see through. And, uh, and the fact that there was uh, flames in the cavity, that tells you that the fire had already progressed into the cavity. So if anything, the conclusion that you can make is at that point, uh, the fire service knew that the fire was in the cavity. But does it help us at all, his evidence about breakout from the compartment? It's too late. It's too late in time. Yeah. yeah. So finally, on this topic, I've asked you before about the possibility that with, with additional ventilation in that room, in that kitchen, for example, around the doors, and if the fire was not in the centre of the room but at the, in a corner or against a wall, whether there could have been local areas within the smoke layer um, where temperatures could have been higher and might have melted, for example, the following elements, the window frame and its fixings, is that possible? Of course. I mean, it, and it doesn't need the extra ventilation or it doesn't need uh, the flames 
uh, to be in any particular position. Effectively, what you have is a, fl a flame, and if the flame, for whatever reason, is tilted uh, in, the, in a certain direction, it might be impinging on many of the objects that, that are there and, uh, and could potentially heat them up uh, quite significantly. Yeah. So you're talking here about direct flame impingement potentially could have melted the window flame and its fixings. What about weakening the, the plastic thermal disruptor that held the, the two-part window together? Uh, everything, everything is possible. And the, the XPS core of the, the window infill panels, which are to the, to the left of the kitchen window? Same. I mean, I think, yep. And melting of the components between the ends of the window assemblies and the original structure? Uh, m these are made of aluminum, I presume. Yeah. And uh, so the melting temperatures are about 600. And uh, so you have to have, uh, you know, for melting of aluminum, you have to be able to demonstrate what kind of size of a fire you will be able to need to get to those temperatures. But effectively, if you put it close enough, uh, you will be able to get to those temperatures. I'm now going to turn to some connected but different topics. Uh, compartmentation. Um, do you agree that a high degree of compartmentation around each flat, enclosing every service riser, the stairs, the lobbies, is the first layer in the layer of safety, forming the basis of fire safety guidance in high-rise buildings? Uh, the compartmentation is the one layer that not only gives you protection, but gives you robustness to the strategy. It's very difficult to break compartmentation. So uh, it is an incredible, it's not the first layer of protection. It is a very important layer of protection because it's the only one that really brings robustness mm -hmm. in, in, into the system. Uh, the other ones can all fail and, uh, and there's no recovery from them. So if the smoke detector doesn't work, the smoke detector does not work. While if the compartmentation gets a crack, you might get a little bit of a leak, but you still get a significant amount of protection. So the compartmentation in itself provides that component of robustness that no other layer of protection provides. So you agree that that's the critical feature in the design of high-rise buildings? For this type of high-rise buildings, yes, it is a critical feature. And is it your evidence that in the event of any fire starting near a window at Grenfell Tower, there was a disproportionately high probability of fire spread into the cladding system? Absolutely. And you've said in your report that based on your analyses that the size of the fire that could breach the UPVC and ignite the combustible materials around the window are within a range that can be considered a feasible event within a residential kitchen. Is that correct? Uh, beyond that, I think it will be an event that will happen inevitably in a kitchen in a residential house. So it has a probability, what I call a probability of one. Yes, I, I, I've been asked to ask you yeah. about that. When you say it's got a probability of one, precisely what do you mean by that? You mean it's inevitable? It's, uh, a, a, a fire of a frying pan is going to happen in a kitchen uh, within the life of, of the building. And uh, when we design, for example, for compartmentation, we design for a post-flashover fire. So we accept that everything smaller than that is very highly probable, so we have to design our compartmentation to withstand a post flash over fire. So, uh, so yes, I mean, this is a, an inevitable, it's perfectly foreseeable event. And you also say that because a fire of this nature can be expected, the building is required to respond appropriately. Precisely what do you mean by that? What, what I said at the beginning was that uh, fires are very common events, but fires that create significant damage are rare events and we design buildings to make that happen. So we produce all these layers of safety to try to make sure that we turn a very high probability event into a very rare event. So the building is required to respond, to deliver that, so that a fire of this nature doesn't progress beyond a kitchen. And I want to just focus for a moment, before we leave stage one, on, on the end of stage one, of breach of the compartment of origin. Do you agree that, in principle, there is a defined point in time at which compartmentation is breached? Um, yes. So there, there, there is a, I mean, it, obviously it's very hard to pinpoint exactly, you know, when uh, that point is. 
but by 105, you already see dripping of burning polyethylene. So it is clear that at that point, there is external propagation uh, happening somewhere in, in, in there. So, so that already in itself gives you a clear idea that the fire is progressing in a manner that is unexpected because it is not a flame being projected outside and not igniting anything or, project or propagating into other spaces. It is a flame that has barely come outside, but it is already creeping mm. into the external components of the building. So that, that's your evidence about the time when compartmentation has failed. Uh, yes. That's an estimate of time that I put as the end of my stage one. Which is 105 to 108 or 105? Mm. Well, 105 to 108. Yeah. And, and a slightly different question, at what time do you think compartmentation had visibly failed, or is it the same answer? Well, it has clearly failed by 108, 109, and there's evidence of failure by 105. So between those two times, um, you have uh, an evolution of the images, as you saw from the video, an evolution of the images that by the time you end the minute 108, it is very clear that you have external components burning. By the time you are in 105, you have the first evidence. So you have that range of time where, um, where it becomes absolutely clear that there is external burning. And do you think that that is the point that firefighters ought to have realized that compartmentation had been breached? I mean, that's a very difficult question to answer because it is uh, how do you interpret the images? Now, clearly, firefighters are used to see flame projections because a post flash over fire will normally break the window and you will have a flame projecting to the outside. Being able to identify that that flame is not a flame projection, but it is actually a flame that is creeping into the, in, into the building requires a level of training that enables them to understand a complex structural system. And that's a, that's a very different question. Now, obviously, by the time you get to 111, you know, then it is fairly obvious pieces are beginning to fall down. So by 111, you can say it is clear that something is burning on the outside. Uh, but, uh, but the interpretation is the hard part, is how you interpret what you're seeing. At the stage that compartmentation is breached, is your evidence that ignition of other components of the facade and the external flame spread is inevitable in this situation? Yes. And you also say that the assumption underlying the stay put policy or approach is no vertical flame spread, is that correct? Yes. So is it right that once the compartment's been breached and you have ignition of the facade, it is going to be undermining and in invalidating of the stay put policy? It, it invalidates by definition the stay put policy because it's based on a required boxing of the fire into one compartment. And is it your view at that point that once that's breached, compartmentation is breached, egress or, or rescue rather than stay put is a preferred option? It, it is my my opinion that that will be the case. So I now want to turn to stage two of your analysis. Now you have stage two as covering the fire ascending to the top of the east elevation and the associated <coughs> vertical fire spread and that's between approximately 1.05 a.m. and 1.30 a.m. Is that correct? Yes. And I want to consider first the importance of this vertical fire spread. Now, you say in your report that the flame spreads rapidly from level four to the architectural roof detail in approximately 12 to 15 minutes from the establishment of flames on the facade. Is that correct? Yes. And you also say that, in general, vertical flame spread is much faster than horizontal flame spread, and this was the case at Grenfell Tower. Is that right? Yes. Now, we heard something about this when Professor Bisbee gave his presentation back in June, but can you just explain again in very simple terms why vertical frame spread is expected to be so much faster? Yeah. Uh, I, I, think, I think here it's, it's really important to understand the, the physics behind it because when we're talking about a fire, we're thinking about fuel burning with air and, uh, and producing energy. And, um, and that is the concept of a fire. If it's in a box, the, the energy will be used to heat up that box and the energy is accumulating. In the case of flame spread, it is extremely important to understand where the energy goes 
because depending on where the energy goes, you have a capacity to continue to spread the fire. Because if you think about it, it's the energy that you're producing that is heating up the other material until it makes it ignite and allows the flame to spread. So the flame is going to be jumping up as we provide energy and we heat the material and we allow that material to ignite. So if I'm in a vertical wall and I'm producing energy here, the energy is going to go up. So it's going to start heating up all this area. So effectively, all the energy that I'm producing is being delivered to the material step by step. So effectively, I'm not losing energy. All the energy is going to where it's supposed to go. So it is heating up the material very rapidly and allowing it to ignite and allowing the flame to spread. Now, if I'm trying to spread down, which is what we call opposed spread, then I'm producing the energy here. The energy is mostly going up, and only a minute fraction is going down because all the, cold, the gases are going up. No? So effectively, what you're getting is very weak spread because you have very little energy heating up the material and bringing it to ignition. If you spread laterally, in that case, what you have is the heat is going up, and you're trying to heat on the side. Now, obviously, the flames are sometimes going to tilt, so you're going to get a slightly better condition. But still, you are going against the flow because the flow is coming here and bringing the heat up. So because all the heat is going in the direction of spread, vertical spread is going to be significantly faster than downward spread or lateral spread. Both cases are what we call opposed flame spread, while this is what we call forward spread. Yeah. Now, the final nuance to this is that if I don't have enough energy, then it will not spread. While with vertical, I will always have enough energy because all the energy is going there. It just take longer. So if this is a weaker fire, it will take slightly longer, but eventually it will get there. But here, because I'm fighting against cold air, I might not have enough energy, so it actually will not spread. Yeah. So in the case of a post spread, you might get a condition where it actually just doesn't even mm -hmm. spread at all. Yeah. While in the case of vertical spread, it will most likely go all the way up. Yeah. Now you say that this is all very well traversed in the available literature, including uh, in, in Drysdale, who has this at um, vertical spread at 10 times faster, is that than horizontal flame spread? Uh, I, I don't remember exactly uh, the 10 times faster, but I will imagine it will be the lateral, yeah, yeah the horizontal yeah. flame spread. And, and <clears throat> you've said that whilst there's not much reliable data on the characteristics of other international fire events, the most common scenario is flame spread rapidly upwards with very limited lateral frame spread, is that right? Yes, because the, the, the third factor is the available fuel that you have. So if you don't have the capacity to spread fast enough laterally, by the time you've burned out all the material, then you stop having the energy supply and then it stops burning. So depending on what is the amount of fuel that you have, you will have a longer time to assist the spread. So if you, have, if you don't have very much fuel, which is normally the case in this particular type of installations, uh, then you will not be able to spread horizontally or downwards. Now, you, you've given some examples of what you were just talking about. Can we go to those at figure 21? That's JTOS 601 at page 59. So we've do, you've given us three examples here, the torch building in Dubai, the lacrosse building fire in Melbourne, and the address building in Dubai. Can you just very briefly talk us through each of those yes. by reference to this concept of vertical flame spread, much rapid and less horizontal flame spread? Yep. Um, the, the, the most clear ones are the top two, so to be the torch and the lacrosse building. So as you can see, in the torch building, you have a very large fire that propagates upwards. And on the right-hand figure, you will see in the left corner, uh, it's an unfortunately a different angle of the, but in the left corner, you will see the damage area of the building. And you can see it's a very narrow strip that has propagated all the way from the bottom to the top. Uh, in the case of the lacrosse building, you have a fire that starts in the balcony in an air conditioning unit, and it spreads over the cladding uh, all the way to the top. But it, as you can see from the right picture, there's only one row of apartments that gets affected, and, and it never spreads uh, laterally. In the case of the address, 
is slightly more complicated because there is a bit of lateral flame spread in the case of the address because as you can see it was a windy day so the wind is carrying the flames to the one side but, mm -hmm. uh, but the rate at which it propagated vertically uh, was easily ten times uh, much more than ten times greater than the lateral spread so and, and eventually this fire dies on its own uh, before it actually manages to to go more than than two and a half apartments. Yeah. So y you said that the available footage from these incidents indicates that once flames spread to the top, they proceed to decay and eventually extinguish. Is yes. That, is that right? And you've actually quantified the flame spread rates in those other international fires compared with Grenfell. Can we just look at that? That's figure 23 at page 61 of your report. So can you just explain to us here, we've, we seem to have lots of different fires at the bottom, and then what do we see in the, in the, the graph? Yeah, so, so what, what you see in, in, the, in the horizontal axis is the different events uh, from the Andraus building in 1972 uh, uh, all the way to the Grenfell Tower, and then you get an average uh, vertical uh, external flame spread. Now, given that the, the quality of the images is, is not always consistent, what we opted to do here was just uh, take a few data points that we could actually see and then just take an average, N knowing that normally the flame spread starts slower and then it starts speeding up, so it accelerates at the end, but we didn't include that. Uh, that's why we have the error bars in there to show that at the maximum value, for example, the case of the water uh, club, at the maximum value was 25, at the minimum value was 5, so it gives you a sense of the range, but the average value is the one that, uh, that is important. So as you can see, uh, uh, Grenfell uh, falls in the category of the fires that actually spread slower. Yeah, so we have Grenfell on the bottom right hand here, <coughs> and, and it's placed amongst the, some of the slowest vertical yes, flame spread with rates. an average uh, sp speed of about 4 uh, meters per second sorry, meters per minute, and uh, as opposed to the extreme case of the address, for example, where you have about 22 meters per minute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've said in your report that the expected heat fluxes on an external wall can be of a magnitude of 120 kilowatts per meter squared, is that correct? Yes. Can you just explain very briefly how you've calculated that? You've, you've referred to the Argarwal Global Research Technical Report. Is it right that you've taken that as an extrapolation from that report? Yeah, so uh, effectively, if, if you look at the, um, the data that you have on internal compartment fires, you will find that internally you can get above 200 kilowatts uh, per meter squared. So inside the compartment you're going to have about you know, 200. Now then once that heat starts coming out, it starts decaying and it, it drops. So this report uh, by Agarwal uh, effectively tries to use that information to create a test. And in their test, they try to create a profile of how this heat flux is going to decay. So it's going to go from this originally more than 200 inside and start dropping until it goes to about 5 or, or, or something lower than that. So they produce a curve that stops at about 15 centimeters from the edge or from the bottom and that 15 centimeters is at about 112 kilowatts so basically I just filled it up and put above 120 because I know it has to go from about 200 you know to 110 in that corner or that little little part. I now want to discuss some of the architectural elements that might impact on the rate of vertical flame spread You've explained in your report that there's a complex interrelationship between a number of different elements uh, of these kind of systems in terms of the impact on, flames, on vertical flame spread, is that correct? Yes. And that you've got effectively multiple processes interacting with one another. Yes. Can we focus for a moment on the, the ACM panels themselves? Um, can we go to the text of your report? That's JTOS 601 at page 60. Lines 1649 and 1651. If we can just read that. So you'd say there, the poly polyethylene infill was placed between two aluminium plates. 
that will melt in the range 580 to 650 degrees C. Thus, in the presence of a significant flame, the aluminium would have represented no protection to the polyethylene. Flames are typically between 600 and 800 degrees C, thus are hotter than the melting temperature of the aluminium. Is that correct? Yes. So you've explained in your report that the high thermal conductivity of the aluminium is resulting in a heat transfer to the polyethylene infill. Is that correct? And also away. Away from it as well. Yeah. 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 And the significance of the away from it? That it can potentially melt it and produce a gap that splits the, well, the, the two panel faces. Exactly. We're, we're just going to come to those, um, the, the, the splitting in a moment. In fact, let's go to that. Let's look at your figure 26. Um, again, that there's a new reference to that because the, the version in your report is not very clear. That's JTOS 603, and it's the bottom diagram. So here, as I understand it, you've attempted to explain what processes are occurring when we get vertical flame spread with an ACM panel where you have aluminium on the outside and then the polyethylene on the inside. Is that correct? Yes. And you talked a moment ago about the, 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 the splitting. You've got a little diagram there. Can you just explain that and the significance of it? Yeah. Uh, would you mind if I actually stand up and no, point? Do. No. Do. Yeah, yeah, please do. Uh, so, uh, to me, this is where the great complexity of the system stands, in the sense that you have multiple layers. So you have the concrete structure in here. You have a material that is a charring material that eventually is going to consume itself. You have a gap between the two of them, and then you have a composite system that has two layers of aluminum plus the polyethylene in the middle. This polyethylene is going to melt as it heats up. Now, the rate at which it heats up in the aluminum is going to result in altering the rate at which it's going to melt. So how this material is going to start falling off is going to depend on how fast the heat goes through the aluminum. Now, how fast the heat goes through the aluminum depends if you have a fire inside or you have a fire outside. It depends on the wind that you have, it depends on the width of the cavity, and it depends on how the insulation is burning. So effectively, you have all this system of incredible complexity all interacting with each other to try to give you the final outcome. And eventually, uh, the system is so complex in nature that it's almost impossible to predict what is its, its true behavior. So when you, we, we were talking a moment about these complex systems with multiple processes interacting, that's what you're trying to show in this diagram, is that right? Absolutely. So this diagram basically gives you a schematic that is actually quite simplified of, uh, of all the different processes that you can actually have all interacting with each other in one of these particular systems. One of the things you say in your report is that the aluminium provides no protection to the polyethylene inside. Can you explain precisely why that is? Yes, so if you have a, f a flame here, and that is a very uh, significant flame that has already been established, that flame is going to have heat fluxes that are quite significant and can bring the aluminium far above its melting temperature. So you might have dripping of the aluminium. Not only that, you're going to have melting of the polyethylene, which results in splitting. So you, uh, you will have the two of them separating, so the flames are going to creep inside. So the aluminum cannot be seen once the flame is established as a protection to the, uh, to the polyethylene. It is just simply a barrier that is going to disappear and uh, very rapidly once you have a flame that is established. And you've also mm -hmm. highlighted in your report the important role of these open vertical cavities, these open vertical mm -hmm. columns. Uh, and you've said that um, the acceleration of vertical fire spread can be explained in part by these channels producing chimney effects. Um, yes. Is that because flames elongate possibly up to five to ten times in, an, in a concealed space? Is that right? Well, what, what happens is that depending on the size of this gap, if this gap is too narrow, it's going to block the oxygen and the flame is going to try to creep outside. So in that case, it will not spread. Now, as I start increasing this, what you create is a chimney effect, and this flow becomes very dominant. So you get a flow that is going in that direction and is carrying the fuel away, so it's elongating the flame and allowing it to spread much faster. Yeah. 
and you say that the width of the cavity is playing a fundamental role in terms of determining the flame spread. Absolutely. So if you make the width of the cavity very, very small, you might end up choking the fire because the air cannot get in. But as you start opening it up, uh, you might accelerate it. But as everybody knows, if you make a chimney too big, then it doesn't draw the air. So in that case, you will start decaying again. So it's a very sensitive parameter that can have a huge impact on the outcome. But it's difficult to know if it's going to be beneficial or detrimental because it also depends on all the other interplay. Because, for example, if this material burns very vigorously, it's going to have a huge impact on the temperature in here and the nature of the chimney. Yeah, we're going to come to that material in a minute. When you say this material, you were pointing there, I think, to the PIR insulation. PIR is that right? Yeah. yeah. We'll come to that just in a moment. Have you specifically considered the width of the cavities created by both the columns and the spandrels at Grenfell Tower in terms of its impact on vertical flame spread? No, I, I don't think I have the capacity to be able to consider that in a quantitative way and establish how that width is going to determine a flame spread. But do you think that in general terms the, the presence of that cavity would have promoted vertical flame spread? Uh, not necessarily. I, I do not have a clear opinion of it. I think uh, clearly will have influenced the nature of the flame spread, but I'm not 100% sure if it's going to be detrimental or positive. But the cavity clearly has an effect. And does it have an effect, we're going to talk about this in a moment, combined with the PIR insulation, if you've got a cavity where the insulation is on fire or flaming, does the fact you have a cavity there potentially gain, grow in importance? Well, ab absolutely. The, well, I think the... If, if you have a cavity in here and you have a material here, you're going to hit an exchange of heat between these two. So not only the PIR is going to support burning within the cavity, but actually the cavity and the burning in the cavity is going to support the burning of the PIR. PIR requires a fairly significant heat flux to continue to burn. So if I was to remove everything and eliminate the cavity, it is very likely that the PIR will extinguish. But if I put all this ensemble and I have this exchange of heat between all the surfaces and the flow and the burning in between the cavity, I can sustain the burning of the PIR. So all these things are playing with each other in, this, in the system at a level of complexity that is incredibly difficult to come up with a prediction of what mm -hmm. leads to what. Yeah. Just before, we will come on in, in a moment, and we may have to do it after the break, to to look at the PR, PIR in a bit more detail. You, you've referred in your report to other complex geometries of the system that might uh, affect the rate of fire spread. Would you agree that angular geometry, including, for example, wing walls or re-entrant corners, might have played a role? So take, for example, a column corners, where we have a, an angle of, I think, 135 degrees as between the, the column and then the, the, the face of the spandrels. Uh, it would have most definitely played a role. The, I think the most difficult question to answer is, would it actually help the spread or deter the spread? And that's a question that I will be, have no capability to answer. How could it have deterred the spread? Uh, because it can, it can, if, if, if you look at the, uh, the geometry, it is all about how the heat is being exchanged. So if I have something, for example, that has an angle like this, then the way in which the heat is being transferred from one surface to the other one is actually far. So it, this might have not ignited. If it's sufficiently far, this might have not ignited, in which case it represents a barrier. But if I slightly move it, and I put it close enough, and then it ignites, then the two of them are exchanging heat with each other, in which case it will become much faster. So, so it really depends on the detailed characters, and many times, unfortunately, will be even coupled to the conditions of the day. If it was a windy day, maybe 130 degrees would have not been enough. You know, well, you would need 140, you know, to stop the spreading. So, all these things, uh, we we can we can really do not ignore the level of complexity of what we're talking about. This is really not a very simple system. It's an incredibly complex system. And as we discussed before, the presence of films or skins or coatings on material, they have the potential to affect the vertical flame spread? Absolutely. And, and films that are combustible are what we call thermally thin. Uh, materials like paper. So, for example, a log of wood 
is thermally thick. And a log of wood will have a very, very hard time burning on its own because it's a big bulk of material. So if I take the log of wood out of the chimney, uh, it will extinguish. While a piece of paper, which has the same composition as a log of wood because it's very thin, it will burn very easily. So thin films, when they're combustible, will have a significant impact uh, on spreading flames. Just to round this off then, I think this helps us explain, can we just go to what you said um, at lines 91 to 95 of your report, that's JTOS 601 at page 4. If we can highlight in on 91 to 95. There you say, details of the cladding will have an impact on flame spread rates, although in the case of Grenfell Tower, upward flame spread rates are not uniquely fast. A comparison with other international events shows that upward flame spread for the Grenfell Tower is among the slowest. It is therefore possible to ascertain that detailing of the facade system, as opposed to its material composition, has only a minor impact on the evolution of this fire. Can you just explain for us why you say that, particularly in that last sentence? Yep. I mean, we, when we designed this type of facades, we introduced uh, all sorts of different components uh, that are intended to slow potential flames or to protect, like, for example, the, the thin film uh, in front of the PIR and, um, and the cavity barriers and, and so forth. So we put all these components in principle to try to reduce the rate of spread. Now, uh, if you compare uh, the spread of Grenfell Tower with, with most of other international events, and you see that actually the spread rate is not uh, among the fastest, it's actually uh, on, on the lower end, uh, you can tell that all these things more or less worked okay to try to slow the spread, but effectively they didn't solve the main problem, you know, which is the fact that we had a combination of materials that could sustain the problem. So I could have put a, many other of these little corrections and probably would have not made even any improvement. Uh, and some of the faults that you might find in some of the, uh, the components might have not been responsible for any uh, worse behavior. What we can see is that given the type of materials that we have, we are more or less at the baseline of the type of spread that, that we're going to have. So you're saying that there's uh the important thing is the material composition of those materials yes. here. Yeah. So I think that is an appropriate is that a good point? moment. Yes. Yes. Well, time we had a break for some lunch, Professor, so we'll stop now. We'll come back and resume at 2 o'clock. And again, I'm going to ask you not to talk to anyone about your evidence while you're uh, out of the room. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Right, two o'clock, please. Thank you.